Well, as I say, we don't normally really do formal introductions on this podcast. We tend to just sort of get going and just chat about stuff and stuff accrues, you know. But I think maybe today, um, because we do, in fact, ladies and gentlemen, have a guest with us, my uh, co-host, my co-conspirator and I, (laughs) Solidarity Brother, um, Kit Power, is here. And we also have a very special guest to discuss today's subject. We have Laura Marrow here with us. Hi, Laura. Hello. Thank you for having me. It's it's a pleasure, absolute pleasure. I think we're going to need multiple people just to carry the weight. Yeah. Of this one. <laughs> so um, one of when one of us breaks off sobbing, somebody else can come in and just you know and and, and cover. I think that's actually yes, that's very wise. <laughs> yeah. I think we need to set that up beforehand. That's a very very wise move indeed. It's um. I don't even know where to begin. Yeah. I'll be honest. I don't even know where to begin. I mean. We've we've put warnings on lots of our podcasts together. We put warnings on them and trigger warnings and whatnot. With this one, I can't emphasize enough. If you are, fe- dear listeners, if you are feeling in any way, if you ha- if you're in a sort of negative mind state in any way, yeah. do not go away from this and read the book or watch <laughs> the cartoon. Yeah. I, I I honestly can't emphasize that enough. It's it's it, it is unbelievable. The the emotional reaction that this piece of work evokes is unbelievable. So what what are we discussing today, Kit? So this is uh this is when the wind blows, which is uh, the the Raven yeah. Briggs is uh, I guess I don't know how to describe it. Infamous. Uh, infamous is probably a good word <laughs> it's an absolutely yeah. incredible piece of work uh, originally presented as a kind of I mean it was a graphic novel wasn't it but it was before they existed really um, yeah that's a good way of describing it actually it is a kind of graphic novel and it's it, given the time it was published it's it's very difficult to know where it slots mm. isn't it like what is the intended audience for this book yeah it's, <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> <laughs> I mean, when did you guys come across it? When was your when was your first experience of when the wind blows? You want to go ahead, Laura? Yeah, uh, oh, I'm trying trying to think of when it was. It must have been. <laughs> I, I I was still a teenager. I know that much. Mm-hmm. So, it, uh, and I think I was lured in by the fact that it had. Uh, a cute cartoony cover. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it's a little bit like the the, the art art style of the snowman it's a generational trap isn't it really is a generational trap (laughs) it really is anyone of our generation who was sort of born in the 1980s who had the snowman around when we were kids is going to be just automatically drawn to this art style it's it's yeah you look at you think oh this looks like obviously it it, you you get a sense that it's a little bit more adult so to speak (laughs) but you don't you definitely don't realize that how how adult it's going to get um and i so when i was growing up i was already kind of very nervous about nuclear stuff even though i was mm-hmm. sort of you know coming of age in the 90s so that threat had really yeah. passed but i think in the in my early years in the late mid to late 80s it was still very present totally it was still like everywhere in our media absolutely, absolutely. and i think reading that was like a like a Vietnam style flashback, you know, it kind of dredged yeah. up all the things yeah. that I'd been scared yeah. of when I was small. Totally, yeah. It's 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 difficult to actually explain, isn't it? I think it's very it may be difficult to explain outside of that context, you know, because it is it's it's a fear that is still there to a certain degree. It still lingers, but it certainly isn't as pronounced in culture as it was back in the nineteen eighties and the early 1990s i mean i've been thinking about that quite a lot in the last week as i reread this and then i also managed to rewatch the film uh mm. in preparation it it feels very much to me like a kind of itself it feels like a cultural ghost at this point you know yeah um it's like because the the apocalypse that that i think rightly is um is absorbing our attention right now is the is is climate change right that's the thing absolutely yeah that's the barrel that we're all currently staring down, wondering if we're going to pull the trigger or not at this point. And it's kind of, you yeah. know, we're well aware of, of, of the shortness of the time scale and the, and the scale of the challenge. Mm-hmm. And this, this one's kind of, this one's kind of faded away and it feels very, I mean, for me, it feels very haunting to yeah to go back there's a to. ghostly quality Definitely. almost isn't yeah. there there is this is, this is, this is the ghost of old apocalypses yeah. of apocalypses past, right. you know, 
Um, but it, it is, I find it a fascinating thing that we do have in our, in our sort of cultural consciousness. I mean, all of ours were born in the 1980s, sort of like children in the 1990s, yeah? yeah? Absolutely. And one thing I've always found fascinating about our generation is that we've been bombarded from the moment we were born with images of apocalypse, yeah. with promises of apocalypse from multiple different angles. I mean, we've not only had the the, the threat of, of the Cold War and of uh, mutually assured destruction and all of that. We also have had climate change and pollution and economic destruction and pandemics and everything you could possibly think of has been there somewhere in the background even in our children's cartoons i mean not only when the wind blows but things like you know on, on a more glib scale things like captain planet and whatnot well and i mean the other it, great ones watership down right of course which is another yes. like i mean if you you know you want to talk about apocalypse i mean that's very much the kind of um, you know the scouring of the Shire, right? It's it's mm -hmm. it's another retelling of that. Yeah, I mean, what I like about Watership Down is the way. Whereas this, when the wind blows, is vast. I yes. mean, it is it's it's apocalypse on. It is genuinely apocalypse. Whereas Watership Down is more of a. It's more of a personal thing. It's more of a. It's 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 the apocalypse of the immediate area of society, mm. the breakdown of society. But this thing, it okay. it kind of like encapsulates and expresses all of those concerns. You know, it's 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 a time capsule of all of those fears and dreads and concerns yeah and i think it's a really one of the things i think that's such an in, incredible i mean you know we've george you and i've spoken about this before and laura i'm sure you'll be familiar mm -hmm. with this there's a thing that happens when you revisit art that you consumed first when you were just someone who consumed art and when you consume it again as a someone who's a writer um mm -hmm. you engage with the work in a different way and i think for me this time re-watching this rereading it I think for the first time since I started writing seriously, it just occurred to me that the central genius of the conceit of this is is the central characters and just how incredibly grounded they are. Um, it's an incredibly fine line that Briggs walks between warm affection and caricature. And it, yeah. it's just astonishing how, how sure his touch is with that for me. It's phenomenally intimate. Yes, I find it. They are everyone's grandparents. Yeah. Absolutely, I think it's, it, that's one thing that, that struck me when I read it. Is so, so you know, it, and as you say, there's a difference looking when you read it first of all, and, and now, particularly for me, now my my like for example, my nan is 81, and I can <laughs> right, and I can right. see her in this. You know, I yes. can see I, I see Hilda and James in the way that they act, yeah. and. You know, as a child, perhaps there was a sort of element of, oh, you know, it's a little bit how stereotypical old people act. And now I look at my nan mm. at 81 years old and I think she would do all of this. She would be concerned yes. about where her cup of tea is going to come from. And, <laughs> yeah. Yeah. You know, and that would be because I think it's impossible for her to conceive of something like this. You know, it's yeah. it, it, her, yeah. her, her this kind of microcosm in which she exists, in which her routine is her whole world. And yeah. I sort of, and I think it, it, it kind of hit me in a very different way as an adult now with the understanding that I have. Um, you know, when I was a kid, it was the, the sort of the macro element of it, you know, the, the, yeah. the, the, the mutually destroyed destruction and the, the, the end of everything and the, and the radiation sickness. But as an adult, it's the small things, it's the, yeah. the micro details, the, 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 the seeing the people that I know reflected in, in the script and in the characters. Yeah, it's it hits it, it. The whole work is designed to hurt you, isn't it? It's designed to hit you in that yeah. most intimate place. Absolutely. You know, yeah. it, it's trying to show you people that you know, people that you have a great de degree of affection for, in the worst circumstances imaginable, and doing all of the wrong things, doing all of the wrong things, not understanding not understanding what they're supposed to do, having such faith in the systems that have brought this apocalypse about in the first place. And it hurts. I, I think it, that's the most, I think you nailed it. I think that is the most painful single element for me and the absolute genius of it. Rather than have them be kind of, you know, resistant or angry or it, mm -hmm. it, it shows them as, as, as attempting to be compliant. And it, it it's yeah. a genius mechanism because what it does is it exposes the absolute absurdity 
of of yeah. the protect and survive handbook because he's going through it's a real handbook he's going through that that existed you know you can find the pdf on the internet <laughs> and it's bonkers i read them all recently for research for a story and uh it was i think it, it was one of the scariest pieces of non-fiction i've ever read because yeah. i read it and thought yes. this is meant to protect people this is meant to yeah. keep people alive and it's just the most it's... inane advice yeah. you know yeah. the, how is the ordinary person supposed to read this and and I don't know. I just read it and thought, you know, if, if this had happened, if this had come to pass, so many people would have died trying yeah. to survive yeah. because of this. Oh, it's it's just yeah, it's it's genuinely frightening. And the other thing that I think um, that struck me, you said the the inanity of the protect and survive, but I think it also exposes the lie of the blitz spirit mm-hmm. in a very um, mm. yeah do you know what I mean like because obviously now we're very fond of the blitz spirit oh yeah the, yeah. Uh, yeah you know oh we got through the second world war with stoically and we mm. you know and, and, the, and the system kept us safe the powers that be kept us safe we knew that it would work out in the end and I think mm-hmm. it's and I, and I feel like it's very consciously doing that actually oh, yeah. when I oh, read it yeah. this time he, I mean, he, he knows full well the, 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 the comments that he's making I think Oh, totally. I mean, he even draws, there's that wonderful discussion they have where they're talking about how um, how it was all, all quite lovely, really. Yeah, that's incredible. In the Blitz, you telling. know, you, you knew where you yeah. were. Every, you knew where everyone was. You knew who the bad guys were. You knew who the good guys were. And even the bad guys weren't that bad, really. Um, <laughs> it was all quite fun. And isn't that the really stark in today's world as well? That, that, that hits a yeah. nerve, I think. Who are the yeah. good guys and who are the bad guys? Well, it- Absolutely. Yeah. It, it's what it's doing is it's showing you that it doesn't even matter. On this level, it doesn't even matter. You know, there the, the the world is a psychopath's game. That's essentially what the book is telling you. Mm. It's a psychopath's game at the moment, and they will destroy us all. Given given half of the opportunity, <laughs> they will destroy us all, and nothing you can do will matter. Yeah, it's a very dark lesson. It's a very dark lesson, and it, it's that it's that it's that inane absurdity of like the the systems that have brought about this situation are giving you leaflets on how to keep you safe. It's like, please, you know, it's like, oh my god, as though they care, yeah. as though it <laughs> yeah. matters, as though they're not in their in their bunkers with their all their stockpile right. and uh, you know they, they they've they've got their infrastructure. They they know they're going to be safe. Yeah. Absolutely, yeah. But but Joe and Hilda Bloggs, who are so not only are they deliberately drawn as everyone's grandparents, but they're deliberately named in that manner as well. They're designed to be these archetypes that you project people you know onto. Um and what it's saying is they won't just die. They'll suffer. Yep. They'll suffer. And they'll be they will try to justify it. They'll try to justify it. You know, I mean, the worst sequence for me in the book certainly comes after that wonderful page of absolute whiteness where it's it's just nothing. It's just Mm. the bomb going off. After that, the book starts to just degenerate as they start to degenerate and it becomes the one of the most intimate horror stories I have ever read. Yeah. It's uh, interesting that you put... uh, One of the things that struck me this time around as well, you're right about... The, the degeneration that as you as you as you turn the pages you can see things starting to degrade and starting to degenerate and start they you know they're starting to fray at the edges more and more mm. and every page you turn it's very you know artistically it's very well done there's quite subtle changes to start with and you can just see them getting sicker and sicker oh. and uh, it's it's haunting it's so good but again you know i think it does tap into anybody who's ever had a relative or someone a loved mm-hmm. one that is uh, you know that has, has been ill and had that kind of mm-hmm. you know that slow degradation and reading it and knowing how it's going to end and knowing that you can't do anything about it there's this kind of really horrible powerlessness yeah yeah absolutely it's it's that creeping inevitability isn't it as the re- i mean even as a kid i think i knew i think yeah. that i was aware that there was not going to be a happy ending here the powers that be are never going to get to them you know no. they they have so much faith in it but you know that that's never going to happen and they're sitting out there on their sun lounges in their garden with oh. all the fallout around them they, they can't see the fallout so obviously it's not there yeah. Oh, it's when they're looking for the fallout. Oh my <laughs> God, yes. I can't see any fallout, so it's all right. You just think, oh no. Oh my God, yeah. I, I mean, there, there, there is a line actually sort of late on that really got me this time around. It got me more in the cartoon than in the book actually, which is when Hilda, Hilda asks, do you think we'd have been better off in the cellar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 
I, I, I was like, up until, I mean, it's a kind of, in its own peculiar way, it's a kind of gallows joke that Briggs is playing. It's like, because you, need, you don't even know they've got a seller up to that point. You haven't even seen any hint of a seller. And what you're supposed to react with as the reader is, you what? <laughs> yeah. yeah. You, you've got a seller. <laughs> And you you spent time building this ridiculous lean to yeah. because the government pamphlet told you to. There's another wonderful moment I think for me, and I, it is it is. I mean, you, you hit on something else I think that's really important about this book, which is it is it is funny. I mean, it, it's it's yeah. horribly horribly dark the humour, but it is funny. I think for me, along a similar line, it's when she you know he hands her this tray and just she says, "What's this? I, I don't know." It just says "misc." Misc. You know, yeah. <laughs> and it's like salt, pepper, playing card. And, it, you know, they go down and it's like peanut butter. We haven't got any peanut butter. Well, I don't like peanut butter, yeah. neither do you. Well, yeah, but it's on the list, surely. It's on should. the list. That's the point, isn't it? It's on the list. It's trying to show you, like, it's, it. there is a, I think Laura was right. There is this kind of commentary. It's almost like generational commentary yeah. where he's trying to expose just how credulous a, and it sounds awful, but a lot of this generation actually are when it comes to things like listening to what the government says, when it comes to listening to their media, when it comes to buying into the propaganda of like the blitz time spirit and all that sort of thing. So there's no critical analysis of what's happening. And you know that with, with, with uh, Jim in particular, because he talks almost all the way through in sound bites. Oh, that's really impressive. As well, and, and bear in mind, this is, this is 86. So we've had 30, we yep. had, you know, 30 plus years of the news being dumbed down since this mm -hmm. was made. But even here, one of the things that I really, I think they capture so incredibly well is when Jim has these sections of long speeches where he's, he's quoting verbatim, from the newspapers yeah. that he's read and he's literally like sounding out the words and you realize yeah. at a certain point he, he literally doesn't understand what he's saying he's literally just repeating he stuff that he's read with with no comprehension whatsoever but it gives him the illusion of understanding the illusion of control and that provides yeah. comfort to him and his wife actually they both draw comfort yeah. from this entirely spurious and that is chilling I mean that's just it is and it, it oh. gets worse yeah it gets worse as it goes on as as Laura was saying earlier you know when as you can see the art degrading and you can see this dirt and this filth and you can see them becoming more sallow yeah. as the the radiation the starvation everything is starting to degrade them he starts to talk more in these soundbite terms, these empty palliatives yeah. that he's got from newspapers, from propaganda pieces, there are entire, like, there's a, there's a big, big panel I'm looking at right now, which is right near the end, and the whole panel is just Jim's face and this long screed, which is just these ill-connected palliatives that mean nothing. Yeah. They just mean nothing. He's just parroting them because he finds them comforting. It To him, it's like, it's like a mantra almost it's reassuring him that the structures know what they're doing the powers that be know what they're doing this is not an accident this is what was meant to happen so inevitably someone will come and save them and hilda i think i get the impression that towards the end hilda more than jim starts to get yeah. it yeah, yeah, that's right. Well, there's that really wonderful. Well, I say wonderful. It's it, I think it's it's the bit that actually broke me completely. Is the bit where he starts. He's 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 doing the Lord's prayer, I think, and he oh. starts going into charge of the light brigade, and you can see that she's distressed by it. And she asks him to stop, and oh, she knows, yeah. doesn't she? Yeah. She's she's completely yeah. aware. She's oh, I think yeah. there's no illusion to that point. And I, I remember reading that, and uh, again, even as a child, understanding that completely. Yeah. And realizing that even though Jim is still, he's you know he's still believing that, that, that the I think it's the old empire will live again, and she has she's stopped. Yeah, yeah. She says to him, "Oh, no more love, no more." Yeah, and you can it's... see that she's. You know why? Yeah. You know, oh, it's. Yeah. But, but it's, that was a bit that completely broke me, actually, yeah, that yeah, bit. Yeah, the book. totally. Well, it's when she yeah, says, should we um, pray? That's the moment, right? And you just know she's got it. And as you say, I think, and it, it, well, it's an open question, is it? Does Jim get it as well? Or is Jim, does Jim consider it his role to the end to not get it? Do you know what I mean? I think that's an open question. Yeah. What I like about I think, Jim, uh, quote, sorry. So, no, go on. No, just say it quickly. What I liked about Jim, when you when you talked about Jim quoting, you know, big screeds of things, is that he uh, quite frequently gets things wrong. Yes. 
Yes. Yes. yes. But there's that bit, so I think that bit, that bit that you were talking about where you've got the big, I'm looking at it now, the big panel with his face and he's just, uh-huh. you know, regurgitating sandwich bites. And it's, at the end it says, the old empire will live again, rising like a phoenix from the ashes. <laughs> <laughs> like, he has no idea. He genuinely doesn't know what he's saying, but it yeah. sounds comforting and it yeah. sounds right. You know, the old empire, yeah. it's full of all the right words. You you get it earlier on as well. You know, when he's recounting to, to Hilda, he's talking about his experiences of the war. And he doesn't even know... I mean, what it's it's demonstrating is that even this war that they assume to know so well because they lived through it, they know nothing about. He doesn't know anything about the uh, the powers that were. He even gets the names of key figures wrong yeah. earlier on. Uh, he doesn't understand what happened in it. All he knows is his own little experience of it, his own very intimate, uh, very domestic experience of this war. And that's it. That's everything he is aware of. There's an of. absolutely superb moment connecting to that in the film in particular where he's talking mm. about Monty. And, yes. and the ghost of Monty appears next to him with his hands on his shoulders. And then Hilda says, oh, he, he must be dead by now, mustn't he? Yeah. And he's like, no, Monty? No, he's, Monty he, he's can't just possibly got promoted or something. And, it, and the ghost of Monty just slowly fades away. Yeah. As Jim realizes, like, uh, yeah, actually, he probably is like he 180. Probably is. Now, yeah, okay. yeah, it's, yeah. Oh, there is an, an innocence yes, to there it, is. isn't yeah, there? Yeah, there is, absolutely. It's absolutely. very much so. I to think, the pair of them. Yeah. I think you're well, you hit on something really important there, Kit, when you were saying that it's you know they're very singular and domestic experience of the Second World War, and I think this is something that we're looking at um, with 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 our generation and with the generations when we talk about the war and we kind of romanticise the war a little bit about, yeah. and we kind of had this belief that everybody had this universal experience of the war and we all understood the gravity of it and we all understood yeah. everything about it, as opposed to we just had these you know very uh, very domestic very intimate experiences of the war that yeah. mm-hmm. you know that weren't on the f- the full scale you know we didn't understand yeah. everything and we still don't and it's ob- you know obviously we can see that with the, with the way that the, the war is referenced in terms of politics now and the the connections that we make yeah. between the second world war and mod latter day politics you know the, the dis- there's, there's such a disconnect there that it, it it's just proof that we still don't truly understand the Second World War for all of our scholarship of it. We still and have course, these very... Yeah, um... No, no, this is something This is something I've written about, actually, a couple of times, and it's come up again in the, the book I've just finished on Tommy. I was going through the proofs mm-hmm. today, and just some of that really leapt out at me. And it, it speaks very much, I'm afraid, to the horrendous current political situation we find ourselves in in the UK as well. There's this, there's this idea of the UK's... Kind of, I think World War Two's become our foundational myth at this point. Yeah. For for mm-hmm. for our, our generation, our parents and our grandparents, that it's absolutely, you know, and you can see why because if you go back further, you've got Empire, and Empire's kind of a bit dicey, yeah. you know, when you think about it. It's actually yeah. maybe not something to be super proud of, but World War Two. We were the good guys, right? We were fighting we the Nazis. We were good guys. We were fighting and Nazis, you can't, absolutely. You, know, you can't really argue with that. And it, it, it's become... But I think whenever I see kind of, you know, the Brexiteers banging on about the Blitz spirit, mm. you know, this is what I think back to. And, it, you know, the line that always occurs to me, and I mean, this does tie in very directly to when the wind blows. So, you know, people say... I mean, you know, literally the Brexit party in the last campaign was saying, you know, we survived the Blitz, we can survive Brexit. And it's like... <laughs> For me, you know, it's exactly what you were talking about, Laura. Like the idea that you you, you haven't connected with the horror of the Blitz no. there at all. Like, Absolutely, yes. How many people didn't it, survive exactly, the yeah. Blitz? You know, like, <laughs> when you say we, but it, <laughs> you know, yes. who are we? What do you but mean, the irony exactly is, is that most of the people who are saying this are not the people who lived through the Blitz. Absolutely. These are exactly. people who have second or third or fourth hand stories of what the Blitz was like from a, yeah. a couple of people who obviously survived it because they were around to talk about sure. it. But yeah. we don't hear the stories of the people who died. We don't hear the stories of the people whose houses were destroyed or who were displaced. It's always the people who... Well, I, it's, it's weird how we've allowed this to be... I, actually, no, it's not weird because as, as a nation, we do ha- like this kind of humble brag kind of thing about... <laughs> we we, we, we labour under the illusion of the, of, of the idea that we're a very self-deprecating, very humble little island who don't like to talk big about our achievements. And yet we... Yeah. 
we take something like the Blitz. Yeah, yeah. central to all of our meta narratives is this. You know, <laughs> is is this the fact that we won the Second yeah. World War, which in and of itself, of course, is a massive oversimplification <laughs> well, yeah. of the reality of the situation. But even down to the Blitz, which let's let's face it, you know, the people who survived the Blitz, it was more luck than judgment. You got yeah, lucky. totally. It, you didn't you didn't do anything, and I'm, you know, this is not to 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 denigrate anybody who no, survived no, the Blitz. No, no. No. But the point is. You, it wasn't an achievement it wasn't no. anything anybody did it was fucking luck you yeah. were lucky and you are totally right you are totally right it's we do love and it's something it's not most cultures do it but we do it very particularly and we and we pretend it. that we don't do it and that's the infuriating thing yeah, <laughs> yeah. absolutely and despite the fact that it is central it is one of the most significant and insidious meta narratives in our entire culture absolutely. we do it all the time we look back not only at our own past but our personal histories but the the history that is in shrined and prescribed to us and we weave ourselves into it in this largely i would say insincere way as a way of giving ourselves a sense of identity a sense of pride in something that we never achieved you know and it's the same as the empire you know you mentioned the empire and it's absolutely the same we 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 need to have this kind of um this kind of historical event that we pretend is not particularly important to us, but that we, we simultaneously build our entire sense of identity around. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And what this book really does in that regard, it just shows you what a liar is. It shows you what a, not only what a myth it is and how devastating that can be on like a psychological level when you finally do realise, but how it, it, those systems and those enshrinements will ultimately end up killing you. That's what's so impressive about it for me, and that's what makes it. I mean, it's just because you're right. It's just it just takes a sledgehammer to that myth, doesn't it? It just absolutely yeah. it just hammers at the base of it and just topples it, just demolishes. But you know it. what? It's not. It's it does it in such a beautiful and subtle way mm. because it is not a screed. It no. is not a sort of tract, you know, it's not a political tract. It is not standing on top of its soapbox on a street corner and railing. It does it in this wonderfully subtle and intimate way where it provides you with the situation, it provides you with the characters, and it just shows you how they would actually act. And because they are so intimate, we know them. They're so familiar yeah. to us, and we know that that is how they would react. That's right. It's so brilliant. It's this very creeping up on you feeling, you know, this very insidious sense. Uh, and it's it's brilliant. I mean, it is, it's one of the most brilliant pieces of work I've ever read in the sense that it does, it, it is almost unambiguously successful. It does exactly what it sets yeah. out to do. Okay, what it sets out to do is, it can be really horrible. <laughs> it's... Just on a, a level of personal reaction, as I said at the beginning of the podcast, this this book and the, the cartoon in particular for mm. me really hurt. They they really hurt to watch. They are not pleasant experiences by any stretch of the imagination, but they do what media and stories should do. Yeah, insofar as I'm concerned. And it, and it's interesting you say. I mean, it, I know what you mean when you say it's not political in the sense that it's not it's not soapbox. But I think that I mean one of the things that I love dearly about this is that it it finds a way. What it does is it 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 completely marries the political to the personal. That's how it that's yeah. how it works. So it sells you on this couple yeah. and it sells you on their life, and then it puts them through it. And and by personalizing, because the trouble with this particular apocalypse, so maybe this is a problem with all apocalypse, is the scale, right? Yeah, it's hard to it, grasp, isn't almost, it? I would say almost functionally impossible. Our brains, I mean, the, you know, there's been quite a lot of study on this. That our brains just, that we aren't good beyond about 100 people uh, at yeah. seeing people as real beyond about 100 because our brains just aren't built for it. Like we're just, you know, the, yeah. the, the, the meat, capacity just isn't there it's not our fault it's just... yeah very small tribal right. groups very oh, you've seen the studies of what they do they where they ask you to imagine a monkey and to give it a very particular characteristic so maybe the first monkey has glasses or something then they ask you to imagine a second monkey and give it a different very defining characteristic so give it i don't know um, a shock of orange hair or something then a third and a fourth and they go on and on and on until they start to lose specificity and it's no not even near a hundred no, when right. that happens for most people it's like around 12 and it, you know all the, all the stuff we've been talking about before about nationalism and i mean that's the the point of those national myths is to try and create a sense of tribal identity where there isn't one right to try and yeah. bind together people who frankly don't necessarily have anything really in common to bind them together yeah um and a way of trying to do that in this kind of arbitrary way that relates to geography but but the thing about the storytelling that that 
it, I, I thought of quite forcefully this time as I was watching it. It reminded me of something funny enough that, that Springsteen said. He was talking about because he'll do, you know, he's got this the E Street Band and they make a big noise, but every now and then he does these really quiet acoustic albums. And they tend to be his most angry stuff, his most desolate yeah. stuff, is the acoustic albums. And I'll never forget when he he was he was interviewed about Nebraska, which is I think is probably his best work. And he said, "What I learned when I in in the making of that album was that." Um, if you really, really want people to listen to you, you don't shout, you whisper. Mm -hmm. Because yeah. when you whisper, they are forced to lean forward to listen to what you're saying. Yeah. And and when the wind blows is is about what you know an absolute cataclysm. But it doesn't mm -hmm. shout at you. No, it doesn't. It doesn't. There is not one point in the book where it actually turns to you as the reader and starts to exposit to no. you or starts to preach to you. It, it allows you to preach to yourself. Yeah, that's right. That's what it does. It's very clever. It's a kind of, it's almost like a kind of gospel in that regard. It allows you to interpret and preach to yourself. It leaves you to go away with the emotions that it's engendered, which is, I think, the word you used, Kit, which is desolation. Yeah. That's, that's the encapsulation for me that's what it leaves you feeling um complete and utter desolation and then it it it, it enjoins you to consider why yeah yeah well i think why? what's great about it is that it's it um there's no partisanship and there's no backstory it doesn't tell you how we got here it doesn't tell you what world events are leading to you, you kind of get a hint of it through what they're saying but they're unreliable <laughs> narrators so you don't really know whether what yes. they're saying is true <laughs> whether they've just gleaned it from news reports but the point is it doesn't really matter how they got there right. it isn't important no. what's important is what's happening so it doesn't matter who whether you know if it's left or right yeah. or which country or what what instigating factor the point none matter, of that it? matters it's not important and i think that's yeah. really when you get down to it that is kind of the reality of it that is brilliant, isn't it? There is a kind of like an egalitarian quality to it in the sense that, in fact, I think Jim actually says it at one point. He actually says that it could have been an American one that, that were misfired or that, that went off course. It fell short. And yeah, that yeah. is entirely the point, isn't it? You just that get that is one kind of, point. and it's a really haunting panel of that submarine in that dark kind of, that dark yeah, sea. Yeah. You don't know whose yeah. submarine that is. You no. don't know why no. it's there. You just know that it's there. And that's all you need to know. That's the, all, all, the only detail that you need of what's happening in the world outside. It's really well chosen mm, as yeah, a, I mean, you know, as, 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 as a panel. It is. I mean, I think you get a little bit more in the actual cartoon, actually. I mean, one of the one of the ways in which the cartoon, I mean, it is very close to the book, actually. It's very, it, it, the fidelity to the book is, is amazing, yeah. actually. But the, the way the cartoon differs for me is that whereas the book is entirely intimate, everything, apart from those panels where you see the submarine and the, uh, the actual missile, they're all from uh, Jim and Hilda's perspective. The cartoon actually does pull away at certain points and you actually get to see like for example when the apocalypse itself occurs in the book it's it's actually stark it is beautiful it's just it's just a white page it's just yeah. you turn the page and there's nothing <laughs> just a flash of white in the in the cartoon it goes the other route it's actually quite elaborate it shows you the bombs dropping and it actually shows you cars being swept away it shows you churches is dissolving in it uh, it's much more you get a, a, a much greater sense of the destruction that mm. this thing has caused yeah and i mean the, the cartoon does that other bit there's a moment there where they're having a they're out in the garden i mean that whole sequence where they go out in the garden for a breath of fresh air just kills me the the state of the i think and this is such an odd note but for some reason mm. it's when he looks down at the at the vegetables that he was growing yeah. That just stops me cold every time. And I, I yeah. don't know, I can't quite put my finger on what it is about that simple detail. I think it's probably just the implication, right? It's just you look at it and you're like, yeah, that's kind of, that's everything. That's, that's, yeah. that's, if that's agriculture, if that, if the plants are dead, then, then, then we're done. I mean, then that's it. You, that's, you, it is a marker, yeah, isn't yeah. it? You know what it's like? It's like, you know, that bit in the Blair Witch Project when they come into the um, the clearing where there's the, the dolls, the, the wooden dolls hanging from the trees. And you know at that moment that they're screwed. That, it's the end. That, the, <laughs> yeah. the film is basically over there. All you're doing after that is waiting for the, the axe to fall, mm. yeah? That's, I think that's what you're reacting to, Kit, because when he sees the lettuces and he comments that, oh, they're, they're all shriveled yeah. up, you know. Yeah. 
you know, you know that they're, they're screwed. There's there's nothing they can do. I mean, in at that point, not only can they not get away, it's in them. That's and the, the radiation is, they is, don't. Yeah, sorry, yeah. No, I have to keep interrupting. No, no, please. <laughs> no, the worst thing is they don't they don't comprehend it. I think that's the bit as oh, well. There, yeah. are, I think it's it's the bit where she says, "Oh, what does the fallout look like?" And he says something like, "Oh, I don't know. It wasn't in the pamphlets." I think it's a bit like yeah. snow. And you just think they they just they don't understand. I know. I I, yeah. I can understand. I, I can see the signs, but they're living it and they don't know. They don't understand. No. And no. The- in fact, I think she actually says at one point, Hilda, because she wants to get out of the lean to that he's made, and he's insisting that she stays in. And she says something like, "I don't see any blessed fallout." Yeah, yeah. It's, oh my I mean, God. Uh, uh, because, because it's not in the pamphlet, and like it co- yeah, goes back yeah, to what yeah. you said about how literal. These, you know, this generation is, and how much they rely on the the word of authority. And if the authority hasn't told them what fallout looks like, yeah. then of course. And again, I can. I, that's real. That's that. Yeah, that seems real to me. Yeah. I can imagine. I think of my nan, and I think of what she would be mm-hmm. like in the situation. She she would look out the window, and go, well, I don't see anything, so it must Absolutely, be all right. Absolutely, yeah. I I think of my grandparents, and I think of what they're like when they watch things like not only the news, but also things like soaps and dramas and whatnot. And I I, I actually distinctly remember one of my key experiences with my grandparents. When I was sitting watching, they were watching the bill or something like that, and I remember my grandmother commenting something like, "Oh, aren't the police corrupt today?" And I remember saying, to, thinking to myself, I didn't say it out loud to them, obviously, but it's a drama. Yeah, <laughs> it's not real. <laughs> but the, the line is so thin, isn't it? And totally, it's it, that's. I think that's one of the the really successful things about this. I think someone said this at the beginning is that it it treads the line between caricature yeah. and reality but it never i don't think it ever really crosses over into caricature no i mean briggs no. does know how to use that to twist the knife though because in, in that same sequence there's the the line i mean we, we would i know we were swapping quotes weren't we on facebook before like a couple of days back <laughs> but it's it's yep. the moment where they're they're you know they've, they've examined the lettuces they've examined the trees they've noticed the lack of birds and the the road surface is all strange and then uh, I think Hilda says something about oh this this incredible smell of roast beef <sighs> smells like roast meat and Jim's like oh yeah well they're, they're obviously everyone's having their Sunday roast early because oh of the my God. and and it's just it, it's just so yeah. brutal it's so there's a brutal. line yeah. shortly after that where they're talking about going to see uh, I think it's the farmer I can't remember his name Old Spong that's right and yeah. he says oh you know I might be closed because of the bomb and he says this one line and it's you know the, the double meaning that he doesn't understand but we understand and he says oh he wouldn't miss a day's yeah. work he'd rather die. <laughs> yeah. Think, yeah. Yeah. It, and it, it's funny you laugh yeah. you know you, yeah, you, you have a chuckle totally, you, you but do. you also think oh god <laughs> there is a there's a despairing humor isn't yeah. there there's a despairing humor to it it's gallows humor of the darkest kind because they're commenting on their own condition ultimately they're commenting upon what we know is coming yeah and not understanding that that's what they're doing. It's uh, the, the world is over and they don't understand. Yeah. They're still they asking who's it. winning. Yeah. Yeah. And they still think like they still think like they can go down to the shop and pick up stuff. Right. Even right towards the last panels, you know, when the it, it's getting dire, it's getting hideous that you're getting the blotches on the legs. And I think Hilda says something like you must go and get some Savlon cream or something like that. And I'm like, oh, my God. Oh, my God. I actually remember when I was a kid. I actually watched the cartoon before coming to the book. um, And I remember when I was a kid, that sequence, seeing them as they're drawn in the cartoon and finding it really disturbing. It is very disturbing. It really is. Particularly, you know, it said with blotches and then her gums are bleeding. And and it's Mm. because it's very simple art style. The art style is quite, you know, it's it's nothing overly complicated about it, but they still manage to put detail, like the smudges around Hilda's eyes. You know, she starts to get these very dark smudges and her hair starts to become, you know, it's the neatness of the hair. It's, it's, it's very clever the the little and then the cut the pa- tiny little touches the color palette the, the color palette starts leaning towards grays and greens and yellow it becomes a very sickly palette yes. so it's yeah. brilliantly done and it is it does hit you on a kind of i think a a primal level this kind of the, the wrongness of it yeah. yeah it makes you feel slightly sick yourself doesn't it there is this slightly sympathetic sickness that occurs i i remember that being one of my first impressions of the book when I was a kid, like one of my most abiding impressions was this sense of feeling slightly sick afterwards. 
Oof. And yeah. they play it out in the animation too towards the end. There's the moment where they actually the, the animation starts to break down. They become uh it becomes stilted. Uh and they you know, they, they yeah. move through kind of cross faded frames almost. It's almost jittery and <sighs> Yeah, there's a slightly jittery, almost like rotoscoped yeah. quality, isn't there? It's very clever. It's very bloody and, and clever. And the thing about that is, if you've ever had like a serious hardcore fever, that is kind of what you feel like. You know, I mean, that's for me. It's, it's, it's like the world is breaking yeah. down, isn't it? It's like the, the the frayed perceptions of reality. Yeah, it is like that. Um, so I think it's a really kind of powerful rendition of that. The other thing that strikes me forcibly about those sequences that again is is very very emotionally difficult is the incredible tenderness of those scenes jim's constant <sighs> rationalization of what is happening yeah. to them and and it, it all seems to me to be motivated entirely by a desire to to put hilda at ease and to make her feel you know oh it's just varicose yeah. veins totally common for someone our age yeah. oh your stomach's upset so is mine it's just you know response to the yeah. brass of vibrations i had it too and i'm mm-hmm. a man so it's perfectly normal yeah and it's just don't you know don't worry dearest women don't go bald that's a yeah. scientific <laughs> thing. Their hair is coming <laughs> out in front she's of she's pulling clumps of hair out of her head yeah. Oh, it's just that. But you know he's doing it out of love, and that hurts worse, yeah, that's doesn't it? it exactly. Because you know, yeah. there's part of it is because you think he truly believes it, but even if he doesn't, it's because he cares so much. That's and right. You just yeah. Oh, it, <laughs> yeah. Even thinking about it just makes you yeah. They're they're even more helpless, aren't they? Because of their age, their age also makes that worse. Because they they're kind, they're getting to the point where they're kind of infirm anyway. So it it, it hurts more. They can't sustain this, you know. The faith that they have that their son, you know, because you see them go to their son earlier on, don't you? And yeah. he's, he's clearly having a bit of a, a breakdown. He just, yeah. he's very, he's kind of taking a very nihilistic view that it's, you know, everything's, everything's fucked, everything's screwed. It's done. Yeah. It's not going to, yeah. I mean, it doesn't Jim like try to convince him to follow the, the governmental pamphlet and to build the, the lean to and everything. And the, the, the guy laughs at him down the phone, doesn't he? And, like, and he says, and he's, so he's sent to the Polytechnic and he's, uh, he's mixing all these <laughs> awful people. And that's right. Yes. Bless him. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. That's right. Yes, there is this strain of slight conservatism in Hilda, isn't there? You <laughs> yeah. know, which is not mean spirited. You know, it's it's just it's it, again. It's one of those things where she's just adopted a mindset which she thinks is proper. Yeah, but at the moment, actually, though, I remember the line. It's when when he he he's reporting to Hilda the conversation he's just had, and he said he just said, "If London cops it, he'll cop it, and not to worry, Dad." What a disappointing attitude. And it's like. But you feel like yeah. you feel like actually, you know what? He probably gets it. Like if he's living in London, yeah, yeah you, it's no, there's no point. This, what are you going to do, do exactly? If, you, if you're you know? if, if you're living in London, you're ground zero. I mean, the good news is if you're living in London, it's going to be quick. I mean, it, it's going to be very, yes. This is the point, you, isn't it? Ground you zero. You've not got it. that much to worry about. No. You're just going to evaporate, and that'll be the end of it. Um, uh, it's certainly better off than Jim and I Hilda. would say so. Yeah. I mean, it's not a choice any of us want, but yeah. I mean, yeah, I mean <sighs> when I was writing, yeah. when I was writing, looking for Lyca, I found this thing on the internet that's like a, 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 a bomb simulator. Yes. It's it's, yes. it's terrifically uh, uh, morbid, but it basically you 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 you. Place the epicenter of your bomb on on it. You get like a map of the world, yep. and you yeah. can put your epicenter of your bomb at anywhere, and it will tell you depending on the weather conditions, the type of bomb, uh, what the area of immediate destruction yeah. will be, what the, yeah. how far the fallout will be, and what in what direction the fallout will travel. And you can set it for oh, atmospheric detonation gosh, or ground detonation uh... as well. No, I use this as well. Yeah. Useful as a writing yeah. tool. Yes. But it was also immensely disturbing because you realise yeah. just the scale of, you know, you think that you're, you know, I'm 20 miles, 30 miles, 50 miles away from mm-hmm. the bomb, we'll be all right. Yeah. And that's really not the case, no, you know, and, 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 yeah. as, and as you point out, in a way, you're better off being at the epicenter of the just bomb. Just being you're obliterated. Gonna, you're, yeah, you're going you're gonna to end up a shadow on a rock somewhere, that, you know, but to, and, to die the way Hilda and Jim die. Yeah. In that slow and that, but that slow powerlessness, because the reality is there would be no infrastructure, particularly if you're living in living not. it out in the sticks. But even if you're in a town, you know what can you do? You can't go to the hospital. Exactly. You have right. to just that's wait right. it out and either. And not only that, you're irradiated. They can't do much no, for you. Exactly I mean, right, they, yeah. they can't even take you anywhere. You know, you they can't expose you to anyone. You are irradiated, and that's the end of it. I uh, use that exact it's, same it's site horrific. actually for the for the finite, which is coming out in July, and it was that was how I worked out what the blast would look like in Milton Keynes if it went off in London, and it would be bad here. Be bad. You know, it's horrifying, you know, isn't it? When yeah. you really when you look at it and you realise, you know, you're not just dealing with something that's 
you know, it, it's not an isolated incident. No, it is. Never. It affects everything, and it affects yeah. everyone. And even in a country like ours, where we've got this fantastic infrastructure, and we've got this, you know, we're still screwed. Yeah, we're we, so if fragile. It happens, we are, yeah, we are fragile. That's exactly so fragile. the word. We think we are so robust, and we think that we are. We've got all these facilities and all these means of keeping ourselves safe, and we don't. No. No. And again, that, all it would require that ties back to the myth we tell ourselves, right? That ties all the way back to yeah. the World War Two mythology that's so exposed by this film. It's one of the incredible mm-hmm. things this film does that I don't think, and the book that I don't think gets discussed very much, um, for perhaps obvious reasons. People focus on you know, the the yeah. stuff we've all been talking about, but I think that there there is, I think that I think there's something incredibly powerful about the way it just exposes. The, the paucity of that and as you say just really mm-hmm. underlines no 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 this is all incredibly fragile this is all incredibly ephemeral this is all something that is delicate and needs care and attention and active protection yep. you cannot take this for granted and I, I, yes and go on sorry go on Kit. I was just and and the age of them plays into that wonderfully, doesn't it? Because there is a thing where you get to that point of being set in your ways. The world is the way it's always been, so it's the way it's mm-hmm. always going to be. And it's such a horrible. I mean, the, the notion of. I mean, it's a horrible. <laughs> it's ridiculous. It's a redundancy. It's a horrible thing to happen to anyone. But I think there's there is a there is an especial horror about having lived a life and then get to that point and see just everything swept away. Yeah, because they think it's over, yeah. don't they? You know, they think they've been, they've lived through World right. War Two, and that's it. That's the end of it. And then this, yeah. something that is entirely outside of their context, outside of their scope of experience, or indeed of imagination, yeah. that ends it on a day, in a flash, literally in a flash, everything's gone. Yeah. It's done. Yeah. And I can't help but wonder when I when I when I see this, and it's still a question that I can't quite answer. What the better way is? Is it a, is it a bad? Is it does it make it worse or is it a mercy that they don't know what's happening? <laughs> is, it, is, 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 there, is there some small mercy in the fact that they are dying but they don't realise they're dying? I know, I know that's a terrible question to pose, but well, do, you know, you do know, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Is it, I know exactly what you mean, given, given their circumstances at the end. They can't do anything. They can't. Yeah. There's, no, there's no escape. Yeah. Is, it, is yeah. it better that, uh, you know, that bit at the end, they, uh, and I think there's something really disturbing upsetting when they crawl into those potato oh, sacks geez. Oh, yeah. geez. The, the, uh, for me that's that an acknowledgement yeah, yeah the potato yeah. sack they crawl into the potato sacks and they just quietly die together and it's it's mm-hmm. the worst thing in the world it's the most awful thing in the world and at the same time there's a little part of me that thinks if you're gonna go just yeah. going quietly at in least the night in ignorance you don't, yeah you know you don't in, in ignorance, yeah. yeah is that is that a mercy i don't know i really don't know well given given their circumstances at the end and given that their, their entire world has become privation and suffering of the worst kind any any tiny crumb of comfort uh yeah i i think that's a fair point i mean although to me them putting on the potato sacks at the end has a real resonance i do think that there is a quiet maybe even subconscious acknowledgement mm. there that we're done. That's this is they're not crawling into the potato sacks for safety. Oh, no, they it's it's a really interesting symbolic um and I probably wasn't thinking beyond you know beyond it just being a repeating motif and I guess it is kind of a shroud kind of thing yeah. but yeah. it's just yeah. uh, there's something really powerful about that moment I think when they go into the potato sacks it's, and it, you know it sounds ridiculous to say doesn't it because how, how how powerful <laughs> oh, is a potato sack but <laughs> absolutely I mean the image is patently absurd and yet it has this incredibly dark depersonalizing quality where they are the living dead they've acknowledged that they're going to die and nothing matters anymore uh, they they are shrouding themselves they are bagging themselves up maybe ready to be discovered at some point maybe not but, uh, maybe but, not just this quiet untold story but i think that's the genius of that i mean that that encapsulates the genius of the entire piece for me is that that's it it's the it's that combination of the of the profoundly moving and the kind of and the comic you know it is there yeah. is something incredibly unsettling about that there is something 
kind of funny about it. There is something yeah. desperately, it runs the gamut, desperately it? sad about it all at once. You know, it's all happening. It runs the gamut of emotions. Yeah. And, and Raymond Briggs is an absolute genius yeah. when it comes to yeah. that. He, I mean, the, the book is not necessarily aimed at children, but it was certainly marketed at children and it was certainly picked up by children. It certainly was, yeah. Um, <laughs> it, yeah, totally. I mean, I, I got it from my the book I got from my local library and it was just, you know, when you used to have those boxes full of the, the plastic framed children's books? Yes. Um, it was just in there with all the others, probably next to the snowman and next to Fungus next the to Bogeyman fungus, yeah. and all the yeah. other Raymond Briggs. And I remember getting it out and I remember reading it. And I remember being, I think I had nightmares yeah. about this. Oh, I definitely did. I definitely did. I say it, pl- it played into a lot of things that I'd been scared of as a child already. And I, I came across it in the same circumstances, which is also how I came across Warship Down. And another book that yeah. um, is, still haunts me to this day, Plague Dogs. Yep. Oh my god! <laughs> Do you know I've, the, ne- I've uh, never been able to watch the animated version of that because I, I, the book was too much for me as it was, and I know that if I watch the the film, I will never recover from it. I, I'd say the cartoon is worse. The cartoon is is just. I mean, we talk about desolation. That that's another one. I mean, Watership. Uh, yes. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, Watership Down does have at least some hopefulness in it. I mean, it, 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 the, the life goes on in Watership Down. Plague Dogs, not so much. <laughs> not so much. The ending no. of the book where the, the the two dogs are paddling and they think you know the island dog, the island's mythical isle of dogs, and they're going to be okay and they're going to be safe. Yes. Yeah, oh my it's God. the same as this book. You know, where they're laying down and they all. Oh, I, I don't want to be buried. I, I give me cremation every time. Wait for the emergency oh, services to come, and it's that same uh, gut punch yeah. because you know that they, that you know something they don't know. You know it's mm-hmm. not going to happen, and you, it's a you know. I keep coming back to it, but it is the powerlessness, and I know that mm-hmm. you're not supposed to be able to change anything in fiction. I know the the point of fiction is that you are an observer, but you just. Mm-hmm. You just so you just, badly want to change. You want to help, don't yeah. you? You want to help. It puts you in that position where you just you wish you could reach in and pluck them out and help them, and you can't. You can't. No one can. That you know, nobody can help them. But Raymond Briggs is so good at that. I mean, he's so good at that. Even when you look at his more sedate work, like like the Snowman, for example. What I what I love about the guy is that he he is not afraid of exposing children to the emotions that he knows they already experience. Yeah. Not at all. But it introduces things like grief and loss and, and anger and suffering in such a brilliant and subtle way. So at the like the, the last scene of the snowman. Yeah. Where the kid goes out and the you just have that quiet moment where he looks down at the puddle with the hat and the the scarf and the last chord plays and that's it. That's all it is. It's this beautiful desolate moment. The same you get in Grandpa. Have you have you seen the, the cartoon Grandpa? No, no, I haven't. Don't. Grandpa's beautiful. Grandpa is absolutely stunning. Again, it's trying to introduce children to loss. And what it is, it's just the story of a young girl and her grandfather. That's it. That's all it is. And they have these wonderful imaginative games. They go on incredible journeys inside the girl's head, obviously. Um, and the grandfather plays along. He's almost having like a second childhood with her. And there is a point towards the end when he starts to slow down. He starts to get tired and he starts to get tired more easily. And there's one day towards the end when she comes to the house and there's just an empty chair. Mm. Oh, wow. Yeah. There's just an empty chair. And you're like, oh, wow. (laughs) That's because that's a universal experience. You know, all of us will have that experience. Um, It's introducing children to inevitability, to things that are very problematic and very difficult to comprehend in such a beautiful, subtle, non-patronising way. One of uh, the book that I really like that does something like that, and unfortunately she passed away recently, is Judith Kerr's Mog series. And she writes a book in which Mog passes away. Mm Mm-hmm. And at first, you think, why? Why would you write a book about beloved cat dying? But she handles yeah. it. It is the same sort of thing. It's the cat was very tired, yeah. and you know. But it 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 it, it simultaneously t- tells you about death and about loss, mm-hmm. but it also sort of points out that everything goes on. Yeah. And it, I think that's a really nice lesson for for young people to learn, for kids to learn, is that death is is an end point. But things, you know, if, even though Mog might not continue. Other things, you know, there are kittens and there are the family. Yeah. Conti- you know, do you know what I mean? It's, yeah. I think, yeah, because because I think for children, 
you know, it's it's, like it's important not to patronise children, but it's also important to kind of break them out of a certain way of thinking. I think for children, Absolutely, they think that death yeah. is very much a finite point. Mm. But <laughs> to give them the bigger picture of death, in that, yes, death is a thing that happens. It is a thing that happens to all of us. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, it's, uh, you know, it's not it's not the end of the world. It's literally yeah, not the yeah. end of the world. And yeah, I think yeah. that's a very important... I think it's something we're kind of scared to teach children in a way. We sort of teach you, oh, yeah, totally, yeah. granddad has gone to heaven and this, you know, but it's... Mm-hmm. But what about on Earth? What's happening here? What's happening? What is the implication of this? Yeah, it's it's a very clever way of showing children that death and loss and grief are things that you are allowed to experience, yeah. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. know? Yeah. And you are allowed to experience them on your own terms. I mean, this is something, and it's it's so strange that he's a he's a British guy in this regard because it, these are things that we often deny ourselves as adults. Let alone we do. I mean, we we totally deny that children have these spheres of experience yeah. in almost all of our media. We totally deny it, and yet Raymond Briggs doesn't. No, all right, no, absolutely. So I recently wrote an essay for university, actually, which is on kind of on the subject about um, <laughs> how it was. So it was about post post apocalyptic fiction, and it was about. <laughs> Um, how so when you read post-apocalyptic fiction that, invo- fiction that involves children there's a really interesting kind of strain that, that I've when I, as I was reading I noticed it repeating throughout all these texts was the preservation of children's innocence even in a mm-hmm. post-apocalyptic mm-hmm. world so I was reading uh, among other books Cormac McCarthy's The Road which ah, you know, yes. yeah, which is obviously one of the I mean I, although I was argue, having this argument with um, I think it was uh, Steve Shaw uh, mm-hmm. yesterday about how whether it's bleak or not which is a very interesting mm-hmm. um mm-hmm. sort of mm-hmm. op- opposing views because i can see his point that you can interpret it as, as something that isn't bleak but mm-hmm. one thing that is interesting about it anyway is that even though the world is dead and even though that survival is you know nearly impossible they're, they're constantly on the verge of, of starvation there are people walking around that are eating babies you know there are cannibals mm-hmm. But he still takes care to to shield his son's eyes from certain sights. There's a bit where they walk through um, an area that's been raised to the ground by fire. Mm-hmm. And there's some dead people in the, who've been basically melted into the tar and have died in great pain. <sighs> and he shields his son's eyes. Even yeah. though his son has seen all of these terrible things, even though he's grown up in this desolate, bleak, post-apocalyptic world, he shields his son's eyes. Because we still have this conception yeah. of children, I think, being these um, last bastions of innocence. Yeah. And if children can stay innocent, then in a way we, you know, we can keep a little of that in the world and by extension in ourselves. And it's a really interesting way of looking at children because I don't think it's true and I don't think it's fair to look at children in that way to assume that yeah. children are, un- are are perfect and innocent and yeah. to remove that innocence is is a terrible thing mm-hmm. i'm not saying you got exposed children to awful stuff no, you know but no of course not no i i i actually totally totally agree i completely agree it's the notion of childhood innocence as it's generally conceived of which is sort of handed down to us from victoriana is one of the most damaging and neurotic delusions that we've enshrined my research i came across a very interesting piece of writing about um the james bolger case and how ah yes and how the cognitive dissonance of that meant yeah. that, we, that nobody yeah. in this country really knew how to take that story mm-hmm. because on one hand children are the most innocent and perfect creatures in the world on the other hand children have committed this terrible brutal murder and mm-hmm. how do you reconcile those two things and the answer that we came to collectively is that these children were evil which is a really strange um, piece, sort of like a, like a, a very superstitious and very strange and very illogical way of looking at it, because mm-hmm. we could not conceive of a child doing something so terrible and yet, you know, being a child. Yeah. And yet anyone who has ever actually sat and watched children or watched them play, for example, without their knowledge that you're watching them, will see, they won't see anything as extreme, obviously, as what happened in the James Bulger case, but you will see the seeds of it. You will see the seeds of the tribalism, of the meanness, of the cruelty, of the the potential sadism and so on and so forth. It is all there. All of human experience yeah. is in children. And we don't like to believe that. We don't, and, it no. doesn't, and it doesn't mean that children are no less wonderful and perfect and great because it's, we, I think you have to understand that a child, you know, children are people. 
Absolutely, yeah. I mean, it's one of the big things, it's one of the big problems we have in this culture at the moment. I mean, it's something I explore in my my actual work, because I work with people with learning difficulties, who are sometimes children, sometimes adults, sometimes who operate on levels that are considered to be childlike in certain areas. Um, but the notion of sort of nascent sexual orientation or nascent sexual identity, now that is a conversation that we cannot have in no, this culture. We literally can't have it. We, we literally literally no. can't have it because the moment you start talking about it what flashes up in yeah. the mind you get the sun and daily mail headlines about pedophiles and child abusers and so on and so forth and suddenly you cannot have this conversation you cannot dare to suggest for example even though psychological studies demonstrate it unambiguously that young children have these nascent sort of sexual and tactile identities you cannot even suggest you know the, that because the moment you do the weird part you, about that is it's in everybody's lived experience <laughs> it is yes and yet we, we all know can't it. talk about it. like it's the i strangest know thing. i know it is so it's one of those bizarre things yeah. that makes me wander around this country looking at people thinking am i an alien am i some weird kind of aberrant thing and yet look that, at the way we weaponize this though it's very interesting because oh, yeah. One of the one of the major arguments against uh, LGBT uh, plus education and stuff like that is, mm. oh, your your children are too impressionable; they're too young to deal with this. <laughs> you're you're teaching them about, but essentially the argument is you're teaching them about sex. And yes, yet that's essentially it, isn't it? And yet we, from a you know, parents from a young age, uh, will will make jokes about children having girlfriends and boyfriends you know is that your girlfriend is that your boyfriend oh is that your girlfriend is that your boyfriend yeah a a boy a young boy who gets on with a young girl oh he's a lady killer look at him or she's gonna be a heartbreaker so we 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 are you we're co-opting that language that sort of heteronormative absolutely Um, and of course there's a whole other argument about the 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 idea that anybody who is uh not heteronormative not straight is inherently a sexual being which is a completely different argument for another day (laughs) but we do but we do do it you know so even though we do it in what we perceive as being an innocent way we are still um imposing a kind of adult yeah. heteronormative yeah. sexual identity yep. on children uh, by doing for this me, and, mm-hmm. and for me that does give the lie to the argument that it's anything to do with anything other than simple bigotry and just totally, terror yeah. at the notion that their children might discover that they are not straight I just, that you know, they, that's they are gay yeah, or exactly. whatever and it, yeah absolutely, absolutely. And, it, and the idea that and, and therefore they you know to superimpose that what they do is say well they've been taught this you know they've learned this this is aberrant mm-hmm. behavior that they've learned which is you know i mean it, it, it it's so on the face of it absurd that it's really difficult to it kind is. of engage and also with. i mean on a wider scale even let's allow for the argument let's assume that it was learned who cares oh, yeah <laughs> you know what does that yeah, matter so what? it's a, it's this it's this notion that somehow being non-heterosexual in any particular way um or just being non-conformist yeah. in that regard you know if you if you happen to be polyamorous or if you happen to be whatever somehow that is the worst thing that could possibly happen right. yeah <laughs> you know? yeah absolutely and it's 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 the the idea of it being you know pro- there being propaganda or something like that you know but yeah. you know and i think i think back to you know to my own childhood and it th- i can't think of there being any propaganda at that time and yet i still realize at the age of 11 or 12 that i wasn't straight although i didn't have the language absolutely. for it then totally, so i feel like yeah. equipping children with the language for a, re- a realization that they will come to independently yeah. because mm-hmm, you know this right. is inherent in people it's not yep. doing any damage you know and i think this actually does come full circle to when the wind blows because we're talking about equipping people with knowledge and equipping people with skills yes um and then you look at the generation of of, of hilda and jim and the skills that they were not equipped with the sort of the faculties mm-hmm. of, of of critical thinking um and and, and uh, uh, observing the world outside of a kind of official capacity. Yes, like out of outside of a prescribed capacity. Yeah, because I that's that's yeah. the kind of that's the kind of world that we want children to live in. We want mm-hmm. children to live in a world where they only know how to do things that they have been taught. We believe that they yes. only know how to do things they have been taught to do. Yeah. Right? That's mm-hmm. what we want to believe about children. Children don't come to their own realizations. They don't have independent trains of thought. They only know what they are told. Yeah, and. That's and it, it, that mode of thinking. When the wind blows, shows how dangerous that mm-hmm. is. You know, it, it, okay, it's transposed onto a different generation. But if what you're doing is saying we only want people to do what they are taught, yeah. mm-hmm. it infantilizes them, doesn't it? Yeah, it does. And they are it there totally infantilized. There is an infantilization them. of them, and, it, and I don't think, and I'm not saying that in an insulting way, because I do think that is a real. 
a, a real thing, yeah. of, a, a real genuine uh, an issue when you raise a generation to defer entirely to authority. Oh, I think it's I think it's overt in the not if not in the text then in the artwork. I mean, if you look at the way Jim in particular is drawn, he looks like a baby sometimes. Yeah, he actually looks like an infant sometimes. But there's actually the moment where they're they're that's you know they're reading through the advice and it says we should tell each other stories and she says I don't know any stories mm-hmm. and he actually says pretend I'm a baby and he, he lies and he puts his head in a lap and his, I forgot about that and his moment. thumb and his yeah. mouth. It's a beautiful little character moment, you know. It really is, and it's it's the fact that it really that's that is actually not much different from how he would have lived his life, you know, at this point. Because you have to bear in mind, I mean, this is a generation that were almost they're almost entirely looked after by their women. Oh, I mean, the the you gender know? roles are very well defined in this house. I mean, the moment when it, you know that whole conversation where it's like you know um, pie or sausage, sausage please, you know mash or chips, yes, yeah, yeah. chips please. I mean, Hilda is the Hilda controls this yeah. house. She, <laughs> she is the she is the the lady of this particular manner but it is a wider commentary and again this is something i certainly perceive in my own grandparents like my grandfather would not be able to function without my my grandmother absolutely and it's you know the the, the kind of joke that you make that isn't really a joke that's i kind of hope that granddad goes before grandma yep. because yep. Granddad, totally. yeah because my nan will cope my granddad will not yeah that's right every single my my mother and my aunt have said that exact thing and you say it, you say it as a joke thing. you know oh you know because he'll never be able to cope but you're not joking no. are you, you know, you're it, not joking no it's absolutely true it is it is a fundamental truth they the the women of that particular generation did everything the 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 the, the, the husband went out to work or whatever and the women took care of the official stuff basically Basically, they took care of the bills. They're often in control of the yep, money, you yep, know. Yep. Um, my, I, I know for a fact that my grandfather would just simply wither into nothing. Mm. He would be inert. He would, he would not be able to do anything without my grandmother. Well, my nan was recently in hospital for a, a, a period of time, and it, it bore this out because my granddad, God bless him, he, he could even really make a, a he could make a sandwich. Yeah. That was I, it. That was the extent of his knowledge, and he he managed in the time that my nan was in, was in hospital to get himself in hospital because he got a minor uh, minor injury that he didn't clean, he didn't look after, that yeah. became gangrenous. Yeah. And oh it just, goodness yeah, gracious! Yeah, and it, it it kind of it just drove home. Just, it hammers it home, doesn't it? Does. It? it really does. There is a kind of infantilization of this entire generation, and again, it calls into question this whole meta narrative. Oh, they're, they're the post-war yeah. generation, so they've been through these incredible experiences, which they have. I'm not trying to sort of de- diminish those experiences, but at the same time, alongside that, there is this profound infantilization of men that's been handed down from that generation, where when it comes to functioning domestically um, in terms of things like money financially they don't know what they're doing well, I mean, this is something you and i have, have spoken about before george i know but like this is it's a really good example of like like patriarchy fucks up everybody it, yes it, totally. it fucks over men in in different but important ways as much as it fucks over important women ways. Like it really yeah is, i mean look at just, the, the male suicide rate in this country it's horrendously unhealthy for everybody <laughs> like, well you get mm-hmm. this this argument now that a lot of men get quite upset when you see these adverts and these you know that either depict men as being completely useless in a domestic capacity mm-hmm. or completely useless fathers and i agree it's not a great representation but it also mm-hmm. comes it, it it comes from life yeah and it not, comes from somewhere it doesn't necessarily doesn't it? come Definitely. from the generations now because i do accept that you know that this, men are beginning to do more they are beginning to become more hands-on parents they're beginning mm-hmm. to but the reason that we have this stereotype to begin with is because you did have genuinely and i, and I know this because i've heard my granddad say that he you know he doesn't do the hoovering properly because he knows he won't be asked to do it again and it's all wink wink nudge nudge but that you know it it is funny but also it's that's that's how these people operate that's how this generation operates the reason Mm -hmm. that we have this stereotype of men who are useless around the house who break the oven when they try and clean it or who can't look after their own children is because we did have a generation of men that were like that yeah and yeah. it became a, it became you know look at all the sitcoms that were in the 60s mm-hmm. and 70s and the, the kind of the domestic roles that you had in those the, the, the na- nagging battle axe wife because she was trying to keep everything together right. the husband right. that was a little bit feckless that went out and worked came home and didn't do fuck all you know put his feet up yeah. and waited for dinner you, that that was a real dynamic you know we're moving yeah. away from that dynamic now thank god but totally 
but it's also it, for for those particular generations who were prey to those prescriptions it's causing problems for them isn't it because they are railing against it it's like they they are feeling attacked by the fact that now men are not conforming to these roles and are not required to conform to these roles that we can be emotional beings that we can cry that we can get we can ex- we can express something beyond anger basically, right. which is the only emotion we were allowed to express for the longest time. The weird thing is, it's, it's uh, perceived as the loss of masculinity and the loss of manliness, mm. isn't it? Even though it's... Yeah, it's very, I mean, strange, why, very strange. It is very strange to me. I mean, so this is a slight tangent, but while we were having this conversation the other day about the, um, the album Jagged Little Pill by Alanis Morissette, because you had that <laughs> ridiculous piece that was saying it was a bad album. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Like, that's just, yeah. Yeah. Your opinion is totally, totally yeah. And then we yes. moved on to Nine Inch Nails. Mm-hmm. Now, you could never accuse Nine Inch Nails of not being masculine music. I don't totally think you could, I don't not. Think you I mean, it is like that accusation. <laughs> and yet, there is some of the most profoundly vulnerable, profoundly emotional content I've ever heard in any mm-hmm. music ever mm. in Nine Inch Nails, which we would universally agree is... Is is is, a, is is masculine music? You know, it's, it's, whatever it's probably masculine like music means, whatever but... masculine is. It's that. Isn't it? <laughs> it is, it, it, it's there, isn't it? it it's is, inherent it's... and unspoken in that music. But you're right. There is this like, it's like exposing the wound, isn't it? It's like exposing the vacuum and the, at the heart of what is male. You know what? Uh, it's it's really cool. What's in fascinating that regard. about that, Laura. I was talking to Holly um, the other day. It's a, a mutual friend of ours. Right, because the, the line that Holly gave me, which I thought was incredible, was she just, and it just stopped me stoned dead. She just said, Nine Inch Nails is male Alanis Morissette. And I was like, <laughs> okay, yeah. yeah. And this was in the context yeah. of hearing the Miley Cyrus cover of Head Like a Hole and just being floored by how good it sounded. I mean, that just knocked I me I never considered arts, that. You know? But yeah, yeah. I, I'm, I have to write this at some point because I have very strong feelings about this. But I really, I, I actually strongly believe that Alanis Morissette and Nine Inch Nails are operating completely the same musical wavelength, mm. and it's, yep. and they're doing the same thing. So Alanis Morissette was, you know, uh, kind of perceived as being like a ball breaker, a masculine mm. woman. Yeah. She's an angry woman. Women shouldn't be angry, yeah. and yet at the yeah. same time, she's accused of being whiny and vulnerable. <laughs> and all these things. Yeah, you can't you know, win, can you? Can't you? Win. you can't win. And then it's, you've got it's Trevor's... exactly the same thing yeah. as like you know the, the same at d- d- our generation like the millennials yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. oh it's, yeah it's, millennials yeah we, 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 we're we, destroying everything we we, we, we we can't do anything we're at the at the same time oh yeah it's, it's you know what though i love how a lot of set lent into that with the the, the fact that a follow-up album to jagged little pool was actually called supposed former infatuation junkie i just love that it was just that was such an <laughs> eloquent like just fuck uh, all of you right just fuck yeah. off yeah Mm-hmm. And then, and then you've got Nine Inch Nails on the other hand doing yeah. exactly the same thing. You yeah. know, and they are doing exactly the same thing. When you know, the, the only the only difference is is the is the the style of music. But lyrically, um, mm-hmm. in terms of the the, the emotional content yeah. of it, they're doing the same thing. Right. And it just comes yeah. across differently because one is a man doing it and one is a woman mm-hmm. doing it. And it's weird how Nine Inch Nails have become this kind of big phenomenon, and and it, no one really talks about. No, it's an interesting one, isn't it? And I imagine part of it is that because much of their much of the men who are part of their audience probably just wouldn't even conceive that anyone would speak to them on that level because people don't. You know, media generally doesn't that's aimed at men. Not until very recently, historically speaking. I mean, when you look back at the even the literature, the music, everything really up until a handful of decades ago, it would have been reinforcing. The stereotypes of masculinity and, and the prescriptions of masculinity. And there are some stereotypes of masculinity in Nine Inch Nails. You know, you yeah. do get so that big man with a gun. He's, a, he's, 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 I think, a very conscious parody yeah. of, ma- of of typical yeah. masculinity. Mm-hmm. But, and I almost feel like it was actually a very clever thing because he's got like a Trojan horse for male emotion, isn't it? Because you package it in all these yeah. kind of industrial beats and these kind of angry vocals mm-hmm. and this kind of very aggressive musical style. And you've got this kind of big Trojan horse coming in, but inside it is all emotion. It's all hurt. It's all mm-hmm. you know. And it, as, as you pointed out, very very rightly the idea that being a man means you can express something that isn't anger you can you can yeah. express your feelings in terms of of, 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 of other emotions there is a whole mm-hmm. spectrum that men are allowed to access and yes. men are allowed to express yeah 
without being condemned for it, without being called into question for it, without being... I mean, again, it's it's related to something we were talking about earlier, because, of course, the condemnation of it is often packaged in either misogynistic or homophobic language, isn't it? It's, it's you're a gay, you're, 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 oh, you're, you're, you're a pussy, you're, a, you're this, you're that, you know, you're, oh, you're a little girl for crying, little girls cry. Um... Yeah, it's a it's a, it's an interesting and very diseased wheel that we're turning on there. <laughs> very much so, and you see this in. I mean, Jim Jim is an interesting example in When the Wind Blows because he doesn't he doesn't. I think there are a couple of times he's he's he slightly gets angry. He's slight, but it's more yeah. more panicked anger yeah. than yeah. than yeah. anger anger. But it's, the rest the rest yeah. of the time it's pure control. It's isn't not. It? Yeah, it's not. It's not anger in that frustrated way. It's fearful anger. It's uh, in the moment, but. The rest of what he does is very controlled and he, he doesn't give in yeah. to emotion. You know, there's no point no. in the book that he, you, you really see him crack. He's very- it's stiff upper lipidness, isn't it? He's, he's being very British about it all and getting on. That's what he's doing, which ties, I mean, it ties, it, exactly, yeah. it ties into the, the, the kind of vacuum that's at the heart of Jim's character. I mean, Jim really doesn't have a personality, really. He's not, like a lot of his generation, he hasn't been allowed to explore it. He hasn't been allowed to develop. He is what's being prescribed to him, and that's I it. Mean, what is Jim like? What are his passions? What turns Jim on? Mm. What excites him? What gets yeah. him out of the bed? Like, you know, it, it seems to me that he's entirely defined by the comfort of his routine. You know, like he gets the mm-hmm. bus and he reads the newspaper in the yep. library and then he goes to the shop and then he comes home and then he has tea. It's mm-hmm. incredibly sedate. It's incredibly just, you know, uh, uh, it's really, it's so intriguing. It's just like, it's like a slightly Edenic and existence, yet, isn't it? It's almost like and, it's before the apple, it's before knowledge, it's before anything. And yet it doesn't, before knowledge yeah. is a really interesting, yeah, interesting thing, actually. Yeah. Sorry, no, Kit, no, 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 to, 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 to go, go, go. No, I just wanted to go back to something that you said earlier on when he was, re- for comfort, he's reading things that he read in the newspaper. And that he says something, he said, oh, I don't really understand it, I just like the words. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, yeah. so is it? Oh, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and it is, before knowledge is, is, yeah, absolutely, you're spot on there. It is, you know, it's, you, know, you don't need to understand it. It's just, you know, no. you just read the words and believe that you, it means something good. And it, that's right, you just almost get the rhythm of it. It's almost like listening to music, isn't it? Or, or repeating a mantra, yeah. you know, it reinforces something for him. I mean, there is, a, there is a stark difference between the book and the cartoon here, and it's, it's an interesting one. In the, in the book, when he gets angry with Hilda because the bomb is coming and he, he tells her to shut up and he's, shou- he's shouting, get in, get in, he just tells her, he tells her to just shut up and get in. He tells her, for God's sake, shut up. In the cartoon, what he says very specifically is, Shut up, you stupid bitch, and get yeah. in. Yeah. Yes, yes. And that is—it's a, a very interesting choice, isn't it? It is, mm. isn't it? I just find that fascinating. The fact that they—I don't know. I mean, were they trying to emphasize just the raw emotion of it? The uh, was it designed to shock you? Was it designed to you know? You are watching this cartoon, and these characters have not sworn up until this point, um, so you you wouldn't necessarily be aware that you're watching an adult-oriented cartoon here. Or is there something deeper there? Is it trying to emphasise or to comment upon something deeper? You know, this is his world starting to come yeah. apart. And he's he's doing exactly what men of his generation do when that happens, when they feel outside of control. They lash out at the women, you know, at whatever's near. I do, I do wonder as well. So, I mean, firstly, it's it's worth noting both the book and the film were written by Briggs exclusively, that the script was, yep. was written. So it would have been, he obviously it would have been his choice to make that change between the two pieces. Mm. Um, I do wonder, though, whether or not this is something that felt the influence of either the actors or the director. You know, um, mm. filmmaking is a collaborative process in the way that making yeah. a comic book is not. And I just, I wonder if, when, with a change like that, I do wonder if perhaps either the actor or the director, you know, said just, said yeah. to him, "Look, I really think we we need something here to just show that, you know, this is." you know, just show the strain that Jim's under to, to create yeah. that. And it is it is a really interesting decision to make. Um, and it's fascinating that it's the same creative guy. Because normally I would explain that by saying, oh, well, you know, the script writer decided to do it differently. Um, yeah. But, I, I, yeah, it is. It's a really... It's such a deliberate exactly, change, isn't yeah. it? It's such a deliberate change. And it, it, it turns the cartoon into something else. That that one change actually turns the cartoon into something slightly different. Just in that one moment, it feels different. 
it feels darker it feels harsher mm. it you can actually feel like there that's where the hammer blow is struck and that's where the fractures are coming there's, from that's where the world's starting to fall apart there's also the implication with the change in line that perhaps the movie version of jim does have a deeper understanding of what's going on you yeah. know that's reflected in that increase yeah. that kind of because she anxiety. definitely doesn't no at that point she definitely no. does not because she's still she's still standing outside like remonstrating against him and telling him not to talk to her like yes. that um refusing to get into the shelter yeah. and then you've got this this is your gender roles kind of uh, reflecting again because obviously the domestic existence that hilda lives uh, women are not you know not encouraged to understand of about course. the ad- that's her sphere yeah you don't you don't need to know about the news you don't need to know about the world outside no. you know it's not important yeah. that's not that's no. that's not your area it's not your concern is it why would why would you be concerned about that your your sphere is here and that's of course emphasized in that line which again is is slightly different in the film not because the line is different but because it's repeated and echoed as you're watching the scenes of destruction outside of the house which is the cake will be burned uh, Oh yes, 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 yes. I in the cartoon. In fact, I mean, for me, I I love the book. I really do. But I actually find the the cartoon more emotional. I, I found that. Yeah, yeah. That, found that, go yeah. On. yeah. Go on. No, I and just that, want to say that I've only no, ever please. been able to watch it twice in my life, and that's why. Mm. One, yeah. And once was for this. So. Right. <laughs> yeah, I, I promise myself every single time I come back to it. I, I It's like, it is, like, you know, a cliche metaphor, but it's like the fallout settles. And I, I sort of feel like I go back to it. It's almost like I can't quite remember what it was like to watch it yeah. and then i'll creep back to it and when i do every single time i promise myself i'm not watching that again. <laughs> no i i i agree i think i mean they are they are different i think the book is is gentler um there is just <laughs> uh a ferocity to the film i think i think the the soundtrack's a big part of that i think the the david bowie and, and especially i mean a, a brief digression here i guess but roger waters because i the pink floyd's mm. the wall is one of my earliest memories as a child listening to that mm. album and obviously that's an album that is obsessed with world war Two. you know that's it, it runs yeah, all, all the stuff we've talked about that mythology stuff part of what the wall is doing is, is deconstructing that in the same way i guess that, that tommy did in a way with the who um mm-hmm. and and to have so to have that particular musician contributing to this I mean, it just the the emotional connection with me is just bone deep at that point because I I mean literally, awesome. you know, literally it's got extra context. Of course, I mean you. literally one of my earliest memories, and this is no lies, to having the double gatefold of the wall open on my lap while the record was playing, right. and just that incredible artwork and the you know the caricatures and the and that music, and to hear mm-hmm. that voice coming out at me in the context of this story yeah um i mean that's just yeah that like you know it's a very for me that's a very personal connection i mean that's an absurd thing to say it's personal connection no it's it's, it's not, i totally I get that i feel I mean, the same way about the bowie song because right. for me bowie yeah. was but bowie was for me what the, what you're describing there right yeah i was right. you know and for him that, that, it's, it's partly the words to that song that yeah. that yeah. i think haunt mm-hmm. me you know the so long child i've never felt the sun and you know yeah. but yeah, I, I agree with you to hear his voice in in in, con- in connection with that. You do make these connections, yeah. though. You do. I mean, mm-hmm. I, I think Roger Waters has got this very this real urgency about him, hasn't yeah. he? Like this is kind yeah. of very urgent, um, and the wall particularly is a real sense of uh, desolation. Isn't the right word, but something a bit like that. It's almost like activist, isn't it? In the wall, it's more sort of like it's angrier. I think the wall. Like, oh, absolutely. Yeah. No, that it's it, it's. It is. It's despair and depression turned to rage. The wall. I mean, it's just. It's and mm-hmm. it's and it's how the you know it all leads to ultimately to that kind of nihilist, you know, that mm-hmm. kind of nihilist and fury, and, and fury and fury. And if you're carrying that emotion from the wall to this, yeah, yeah, yeah. then it does kind of start to to metamorphosize, doesn't it? Yeah. There's a sort yeah. of mutagenic yeah. quality to it. It's all feeding together, isn't it? Because the themes are the same. Well, that's it. The themes between the book and the album are actually the same there. Um, it's almost acting like an echo chamber. It's resonating around and around and around and becoming much more fermented, much more profound. Um, and I, I don't know about you guys, but I mean, you know, I, I tend to engage with media on a really deep level. I, emotionally, I connect very strongly and I can find myself shaken by media very easily. But there's not much like when the wind blows. No, I agree. I, I think agree. I would I would I agree. Think- I would agree. I think for me, and I, I've been trying to put my finger on why, and I really do think it's because um, 
it, it what it does very bravely is it 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 has it's the it has the complete absence of hope. Um, yeah. Normally, yeah. it's interesting. I was thinking earlier when you were talking about post-apocalyptic fiction. Of course, this this mm-hmm. isn't post-apocalyptic. This is just the exactly. Yeah. This is just the <laughs> yeah. apocalypse. This is the end. And the whole point of the apocalypse is that actually there is no post-apocalypse. If it's the yeah. end, it's the fucking end. And this is it. It's the end. And and you you know again just the genius of just forcing us the audience to just sit and just just deal with it this is the end this is how, to observe this is it. how yeah. it ends and at the point mm-hmm. at which this has happened it is too late and you are powerless and i think for yeah. me what turns this into a, a an act of political activism as well as a devastating piece of art is by doing that i think the purpose is to challenge us to say if you don't want this to be your future yeah, you are required now to do something about it. Yeah, because you know this yes. is where it ends unless mm-hmm. you yeah, get you can't, your you shit can't rebuild. No, you can't. Exactly. And it's interesting. I think that we, you know, post-apocalyptic fiction. I think for all of it, you know, it is a bleak genre and it is a, but it is a, it's a fan, a fix-it fantasy, yeah, isn't it? it is. In a yeah. way, the idea, the idea that there will be a post apocalypse and the idea that we can eke out an existence however miserable that existence might yeah. be yeah it's fix it fantasy because as as this so so bluntly proves to us there isn't a post there is no after you don't get yeah. a do-over once it's done it's done yeah it's over you're done yeah, yeah and i think it's the most honest it's honest that's the yeah. thing a lot of mm-hmm. a lot of apocalyptic fiction isn't honest it no. tells us these comforting lies. It tells us that, you know, civilization can rebuild. Yeah. We are yeah. going to get a second chance and it won't and it can't. <laughs> and, mm-hmm. Yeah. And, and to, you know, to tie it back with the World War II myth, I mean, this is this is like telling the story of the people who didn't survive the Blitz, right? This is like telling the story of the of the people who didn't survive D-Day. We always hear about the heroes. Of course we do. And I'm not, you know, <laughs> again, their stories worth hearing. Absolutely. But the reason we hear those stories and only those stories is there's no one to speak for the dead. They're gone. This is it. And we hear it in, you know, know, we hear it in every justifying, nostalgic, bucolic lie of the past, which people tell themselves over and over and over and over, particularly older people. I mean, I know that sounds sort of terrible, but it is it does seem to be generally true. They tell themselves things like, I mean, something I've I've been hearing consistently in reference to Brexit is, well, we didn't starve. Yeah. Well, A lot of people did. You but didn't. The, a lot of people did. The other did. thing that's very telling about that, sorry, just to jump in quickly, because it, but it's the, the the thing about that is that's it's the immediate post-war generation that say that. Actually, when you look at the, the, the relatively few now survivors of World War II, mm-hmm. they're actually overwhelmingly pro-European because they yeah. remember what it was like when there wasn't a united mm-hmm. europe and they don't want to go back so actually it's really fast yeah. it's what what's interesting is it's the it's the people who were brought up in the shadow of the war but didn't actually live mm-hmm. through it and in the shadow of the mythology of the war those are the ones yeah. with all this glib kind of oh how bad can it be oh, how bad can it be all you've got mm-hmm. to do is look at war poetry you know the very yeah, famous yeah. wilfred owen dolce of course. decorum est dolce you know, decorum est, est. Yeah. That, that 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 you know he tell with, with such fervent zest that great lie you know yeah. he's it's that's where you have to look that's um that's what I say to every nationalist I encounter, basically, at this <laughs> point. And if they don't know what I'm talking about, then I don't talk to them. Then that's, if they don't know what you're talking about, they, 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 they don't They, they don't, have a... don't get a place at the adult table. <laughs> no, I completely agree. <laughs> so uh, but last year I was, in, um, I was in Japan and we visited Hiroshima. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, which oh, is a very... Wow. Hiroshima, actually, uh, one thing I will say about Hiroshima, I thought it was going to be an incredibly morbid place. It's actually one of the most beautiful places I've ever been to in my life. It's, right. it's, and it, what's interesting about Hiroshima is the whole city is based on um, uh, a will for that to never happen again for us never yeah. never yeah. Uh, you know it's but in a hopeful way it's you know it's, yeah. the, the 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 goal is peace you right. know it's yeah. not it's not even a never again or lest we forget it's it's about peace it's about yeah. you know let's move forward into a peaceful era and once so there, there's there's a, a well, generation like a... no go ahead go ahead no, no, no! Please, please carry on. No, I was just going to say there's a generation of, um, of of Japanese people called Hibakusha, which were the survivors of of, of the bomb. Um, either either survived as children or you know as adults and went, went on, grew up and survived. And they a lot of them give talks. So when we were at the oh, A bomb wow. dome, there was a Hibakusha survivor there, and he was giving out leaflets of talks. Now we didn't have time; we were only there for a day. But it's something that I want to go back to to do, because Japan, like Britain. 
it's very much about uh, we 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 gloss over the bad things that happened and we talk mm -hmm. about the good things that happened. We don't like to yeah. talk about the fact that there were bad things in the war and that we did bad things in the war and that the war was a bad thing. We mm -hmm. just like to talk about all the good things that we did and how brave we were and yeah. and how great everything was. Um, and the hibakusha are quite um, uh, ostracised in Japan for this same reason because they're giving a different narrative. They're telling a different story. They're telling the story of the people. You know, as, you know where you say oh, that wow. you don't. Yeah, it's really interesting. So you, you, you know where you say that there's nobody to speak for the dead. Yeah. In yeah. a weird way, the hibakusha do speak for the dead. They That's didn't die, very but they. It's, it's, if, when I go back there, and I will go back there, I, I do want to. To, to hear that hear what they have to say because I think yeah. for a start it's an incredibly important perspective but also it's a perspective you don't get to hear no that's, that's right they, yeah they, you know? yeah totally we we are more obsessed with the stories we're more obsessed with the myth because it feeds us I mean we we are conditioned from any I mean anyone born to generations after that immediate post-war generation are going to be fed with this myth and they're going to have it pumped into them you know just into their very souls that we won the war and it's it's a great thing and that we were the good guys and it's very patriotic this little island stood against the great enemy um and it's simply not, not only is it a simplification of the reality, but when you have something that challenges that, it becomes interpreted as a personal attack mm. because pe you are attacking the foundation, you are criticizing the foundations upon which people build identity for better or worse. And that's when it becomes a problem because you are not just then criticizing a meta narrative you are actually attacking people that's how they interpret it that's how it's, it's exactly the same as when you criticize elements of religion for example or of of, of more nascent spirituality or whatever because we we are so as a species we do have this problem whereby we like things to be absolute and we like to identify with things we like things to give us identity even down to shit like the, the tv that we watch or the toys that we played with or the cartoons that we watch we love to derive Drive identity from those things and it's not always the the healthiest thing <laughs> no, it's not you know we see it now even now with the weird tribalism did you love or hate the game of thrones ending if yeah you, we've, if we've you, discussed yeah. that one. <laughs> yeah. you, we've done if you that loved one it, if you loved it you're an idiot if you hate it you're a, you're a, you're a whiner you know it's, it's yeah. you, you can't just have a differing opinion on something no, we, there are tribes aren't there it's like i think the way i think the way we described it in our, in our we did actually that last uh, last episode and the way we described it was you can't just be someone who happens to enjoy Game of Thrones. You are a Game of Thrones fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's your tribe, you know? And that seems to be the problem. I'm seeing it very much like in um if you go around Facebook and I mean I mean I'm into lots of different like fandoms and things. I like things like 1980s cartoons and Transformers and Dungeons and Dragons and all that stuff. I love that stuff. But what you what I do notice is there is this creeping tribalism, this accruing tribalism around those factors around those fandoms whereby you will get these posts where there are memes talking about how oh if you watch this as a child your childhood was great and I'm like well no and also <laughs> you know there seems to be this inability to understand that you can love these things as I do I love those cartoons but they were shit <laughs> if you watch them now they're appalling I they do not hold up. My husband is a huge, huge, huge Transformers fan. Um, and oh, I, I like solidarity. It yeah, it, and I watched. You know, you watch it now. It it doesn't hold up. The animation is it's, awful. It's and, appalling. The, the, there's the you know the spatial uh, awareness of it. You know, sometimes a robot is the same size as a house, and then the next yep. minute it's going inside a car. Is <laughs> totally that. Totally that. You've got you've got things like. Uh, one robot speaking, it's it's sort of lip flaps moving, and it's another character's voice coming out of it. It's. Oh, I mean, it's, it's, I'd love to. It's one atrocious. day I want to do a whole episode on the uh, whole a whole podcast on the episode Autobop, which is one of the weirdest oh. things I've ever seen in my life. But that's for another yeah. day. Um, yeah. But the point is, you can make all of these criticism and still love it with all of your heart. It doesn't yeah. mean Absolutely. that you don't love it. In the same way that I, you know, you know, I am a Game of Thrones fan. I still mm -hmm. think the last series was shit. Doesn't not make me a Game of Thrones fan. Absolutely. You know, it's, it's a weird like you have to, you have to have everything. You have to toe the line. You have to, you have to right. follow the right narrative. I, it's, it's it has oh, to be absolute, doesn't yeah, it? It has to be absolute somehow. Otherwise, you're not a real fan. I just uh, and also you, this notion. 
you know, this notion of identifying with such arbitrary things as well as the cartoons that you grew up with, to the point whereby you get this blindness where you can't accept that, for example, like, I, I, obviously I loved the original Transformers cartoon, and when the cartoon Beast Wars came out, which is sort of like the next generation of Transformers, so many people hated it. So many people hated it. It is vastly superior on every <laughs> level. It's vastly superior. Real characters, real writing, great scripts, overarching mythology, genuine dialogue going on, you know? Not just exposition. It's vastly superior. And th that, to me, is what is kind of like a microcosm of what we're talking about, where you are unable to to perceive beyond what the prescription of the ideology is, you know? Absolutely. And it's, it's a real problem. But also you've got to remember as well that the, the people that we were as children are not the people that we are now. And some of our loves mm -hmm. will carry over. And some of our loves, like, yeah. you know, when you talk about Kit, um, when you talk about Pink Floyd, it's the same with me for mm -hmm. Bowie. You know, as you grow up, you retain that love and it changes, yeah. but it's still the same mm -hmm. kind of strong, pure love that you have yeah. for a thing. But equally, there are things that you'll watch as a child with the mind of a child, with the understanding of a child... Yeah. Um, that you then watch as an adult and have a completely different view of because you're not a child anymore. You're not, you don't have that mind. And that's fine. You know, I think yeah. we have to accept yeah. that it's all right to look back at these things and think, mm -hmm. that actually sucked. Or, or, you know, and it's all right to look back at yourself yeah. too, you know? It's all right to look back at yourself and say, that person is dead now. <laughs> it's okay, I you know? I hope that we can say that because I definitely am not the same person now that I was when I was 17. There are, you no. know, and, and, See, this is... Now, this is going into a really different kettle of fish so I, won't, I won't dwell on it too much but when you see things on the internet about things that people said 10 20 years ago that were problematic yeah. and you know we have to be able to accept that in some circumstances a person can turn around and say i was a dick yeah i yep. was a dick yeah um, you know mm -hmm. i was wrong and i've yep. learned you know but that is a legitimate response to these things okay you know the burden of proof is on the person saying they've changed grant you that yeah. but we have to accept that people do change and people do grow the things that i said when i was 17 are not the things that i say at 32 because i've changed absolutely absolutely i do i do think kit weren't you having a conversation on twitter with uh, with rowan at one point about uh, recently about your differing political perspectives or your political journey towards um, the socialism that you now oh, hold. Oh, God, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mean, it's actually, it's a funny thing because, you know, I was thinking about the Wrong with Authority crew, who's another podcast group mm. that I work with. And that's, you know, Jack Graham, who describes himself as a gothic Marxist. Who got, I love that. Gothic Marxist. That's great. That's great. Uh, I like that. James Murphy, who's sort of, I think he's still, I think he still goes by anarchist. Um, Daniel Harper, who's kind of social democrat, and me, who's just, I don't know, mm -hmm. lefty, you know. Um, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah, I just, you know, I, yeah. I'm sort of, yeah, I don't know. Um I'm okay with that. I like that Probably. too. I don't. I don't know. I have no idea. The only one I'm comfortable with is nihilist. Right, right, right. My favourite political. Nihilist. My favourite one of that is Elizabeth Sandifer, who describes herself as a as a Christmas and Easter nihilist, which I think is just that's, that's great. one of the funniest things I've ever read in my life. Fantastic. That's Isn't very it? cool. Yeah, I like yeah, that. Yeah. No, she's yeah, great. Yeah. My my political affiliation is anxious and hopeful. Yeah, yeah. That's my political affiliation. <laughs> but I don't that's cool too. I like that yeah. one too. But, but, <laughs> I don't really know beyond that. But the point I was driving at with the with that was we we all one of the things that we've actually all four of us got in common is we all went through what is to now to us a, an incredibly cringeworthy new atheist phase mm -hmm. atheist phase yeah uh, uh, yeah me too and you can, yeah. me well, you, too did you did you read Richard Dawkins oh, yeah. and actually think, I had yeah, 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 think that he had a point and, and I had I had and Sam Harris God, not and great, all the, the other one the, the Christopher yeah. Hitchens and but yeah. the thing is what's fascinating to us now is when you look at one of the sharp, the sharpest dividing lines you can find in 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 that generation are the people who moved beyond that and the people who didn't, and the people oh absolutely and the people who didn't have just spiralled down. Oh into my god, were you were you guys of... insufferable yeah. edge lords? Yeah. Yes. absolutely. Were you guys involved in like sort of like the YouTube culture when that first started to get really popular there? I've been an observer. I've not been a participant. I, I was actually sort of on the on the boundaries of that culture yeah. when it just started to get popular when you started to get like the, the, the prominent figures in the sort of new atheist movement people like Aaron Ra and um, Thunderfoot God, and that kind of thing yeah. um, and you were on I the am front lines. I know right <laughs> I'm so glad that I fell out yeah. of it I am so glad because I sometimes do sometimes just sort of shift back and look at see what's going on there and it is it's a festering quagmire. It's rank. It's absolutely rank. It's, 
It's appalling. Yeah. It is the worst. You know what the big problem is? It's people now who have now they rely on it for oh, a living. Of course, yeah. That's what it is. And so they're totally insincere. Yeah. They are now pandering to the sort of mega hat wearing, Trump supporting, right wing, um, sort of uh, libertarian come neo Nazi. <laughs> yeah, crew, right. Yeah. You know? Um, and they're doing it in such an insincere way because they know it's popular. They know that the people involved, there's lots of them and they won't question it and they will support anyone who sings the right tunes, you know. Yep. Yep. Um, you can tell if you watch them from outside of that culture that they're totally insincere. They don't believe a word. But you know what? There's just an incredible psychological case study to be written about what the hell happened to, to, to YouTube scepticism. Like, because oh, yeah, the thing totally. is, like, that's the worst. I, honestly, for me, one of the saddest things about the entire thing is that I no longer like. I have to reject the label skeptic, even though, yeah, in the definition of it that is that was originally floating around, I was quite comfortable with it as a label. Actually, I thought, totally, you know, and I don't. Yeah. I'm not a big fan of labels in general, but skeptic, yeah, I can live with that. Actually, yeah, it's, fine, there's whatever, a lot yeah. worse labels you could slap on me now. I wouldn't touch that with a barge pole. No. And that's entirely because, because it just carries so many other connotations. Yeah, it's entirely now, because it, what you know? it tends to mean now is actually, you know, race realist in inverted commas, which means racist, yeah, yeah. you know, misogynistic mm -hmm. nonsense, you yeah. know, and a misapplication. I mean, God, you know, did we not have enough of misapplying evolution theory to race in the last hundred fucking mm -hmm. years? Why are we still doing this? Why is You're anyone... Not grown out of well, measuring people's skulls. You know what I mean? Exactly. Yeah. It's called phrenology. Yeah. It's been laughed yeah. out of court. You know, like, let's just... Can we not move on Well, from this once crap? again, I would argue that the problem we have is that we take people... I mean, people like, say, Peter Molyneux, for example. Oh, uh, Stefan, Stefan Molyneux, sorry. Molyneux. Sorry, Stefan Molyneux. Um, we take them at their word sometimes, yeah. and that's 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 a mistake. Yeah. They are insincere. They know what they're doing. They know that what they're saying is bollocks. They know that it's harmful. They just don't care. They know that it gives them status. They know that it brings them money. They know that it feeds a kind of narcissistic element in themselves. Yeah. You know, it gives them, it fluffs them up. It, it feeds the ego. Um, so they just do it. But, you know, uh, that's the raw fact of the matter. But you know, you've got to the point now where I've just got certain sort of conversational red flags. Like as soon as someone tries to start talking to me about a genetic component to IQ, I'm just out. Mm. I'm just out of that conversation because it's like, no, you, you've just yep. outed yourself as someone who is not fundamentally A, unserious and B, almost certainly malevolent. And I do not need to yep. engage with you any further, you know? Totally. Um, yeah. And we need to learn to do that as well. That is something we need to learn to do more because there are far too many people who try to sit down and have the conversation because they think that's the right thing to do. They think that's the civilised thing to do. Well, yeah. I mean, we've been sort of taught that the, the proper thing to do is engage in, and uh, uh, this, uh, another word that's become a red flag for me, debate. <laughs> debate. <laughs> debate. Yeah. How sad is that? Was, How sad is that? It, it is you're sad right. because yeah. the, the fact is, is that... Debate has become something used by people who are entering into arguments in bad yeah, faith. that's it. You can yep. only debate somebody in good faith. And a lot of these people are not interested in debates. They're interested in being right. Mm -hmm. That's yeah. not... I don't want to... You know, and I see a lot of this around Facebook and Twitter and, you know, people saying, but, you you know, how can we... How can we uh, come together how can we change minds yes. and hearts without debate but you're not you know the, the, yeah. you have to understand who is interested in listening to you and, and mm -hmm. I'm not saying they have to agree with me no. but just listen yeah, no. um, and who is interested in, in, in just being right and increasingly the kind of people who, who clamour for debate are the kind of people that aren't really interested in, in a debate which is a two way process they're yeah. just you know debate is and it is sad that debate is becoming a uh, a dirty a word, it is, it yeah. is. Or, or something that you've just got to be wary of. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I totally agree. I mean, it's uh, something I think I believe Kit and I have discussed previously is there is this swelling, even on the left, there is this swelling sort of faux liberalism and sort of faux centrism where they will enjoin people like uh, like myself and yourself Laura you know who belong to very particular demographics to sit why don't you sit down and talk why do you have to be so shrill why do you have to be so yeah. angry why how can you change minds if you don't sit down and talk to them well the reason we don't is because a we already have historically we already have and it doesn't work we know it doesn't work because in privacy outside of when you're not looking looking at them basically when the rest of the world is not looking at you they tell us what they want which is they want to kill us yeah so and also how can be, you have a debate yeah. exactly exactly, exactly. And also, how, how can i have a debate with somebody whose position is that people like me should not 
exist. I exactly. Can't, I can't debate that. That's not for debate. Right. It's right. exactly. And also, it's not up for debate. No. Fuck off. That's right. I'm not sitting it's down exactly. and debate. I'm not sitting down and being polite to someone who who wants me dead. You meanwhile, know? absolutely. Not. Meanwhile, you have the infuriating thing where you have the you know you have that person saying you should be dead. You have you saying no, I shouldn't, and then you have the well-meaning centrist saying, well, the truth's probably somewhere in the middle. No, it somewhere in the middle. Yes, isn't. it's probably somewhere well, in the middle. Yeah, maybe you're both being extreme. No, I think I think my <laughs> asserting my right to be alive is not extreme. I think oh, that's, that's a very basic yeah, position that anyone exactly. should take. It's and, yeah. and and what's scaring me at the moment is the. The, the 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 rank of people who fall into the category of should not be alive in whoever's mm. estimation is growing there is people yeah, being yeah. added to this yeah, so yeah, you know yeah, and i'm yeah. you know not a debate i want to get into too much here is is you know for me there is no debate that trans people should be allowed to live right. and should be allowed <laughs> right, to live right. Um, as 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 the as the gender that they are, you know, that's not an argument yeah. for me. But, but increasingly, that's seen as a point for debate. You know, LGBT mm-hmm. people, um, people of different races. You know, what, why in twenty nineteen are we still having this argument that certain yeah. people, but not even certain people for having done a particular thing? You know, yeah. it's not even like the death penalty debate, which is a different debate entirely. Yeah. You know, I'm still on yeah. the I'm still on the let people live side. But yeah. you know, that there you're arguing about things people have done yep. here yep. we are arguing about things people are and right. cannot be, mm-hmm. be otherwise you know yep. Th- yep. not it's not a matter of choice and, so mm-hmm. if i'm arguing with somebody who is saying that because you are of roman gypsy ethnicity or because that you yeah. are um you're bisexual you should be in this category of people i'm gonna say well no i fucking shouldn't yeah absolutely yeah and i'm, and I'm sorry i'm gonna be shrill about it yeah i yeah, am gonna yeah, be shrill right. and i am gonna be angry about it's it it's actually a matter of your basic fucking rights then yes you should be shrill mm-hmm. about it and this is what you know the as you point out it's not an equal argument it doesn't come from equal footing no. you know if you're a person who who you believe belongs in the category of, of you know because you know let, let, let's let's take it right down to what it is it's it's uh eugenics yeah, it's that's eugenics right. it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, yeah. it's some that's people exactly should, it. some people have a greater right to be alive than other people i reject that as an ideology mm-hmm. straight off of the bat because it, it, it's it's foul yeah. it's absolutely yeah. foul yeah. there is no justification for saying this category of people is inherently superior to that category mm-hmm. of people so no, base assumptions up it's it's done it's yeah, over we're not it is. it's not, not a even debate, debate we should be having anymore no, it's not a debate no, so no i you know if somebody comes at me with that i'm not going to debate you because it's a done argument right yeah and that's and that's why I say things like you know race and IQ. It's a red flag because that's where that kind of logic always leads. And if someone's trying to talk to me about mm-hmm. you know uh, gen- you know race realism or genetic predisposition, I'm just done with that conversation. I'm just done with that person because yeah. it's like no, I I know what that is proxy for. I know where that argument mm-hmm. leads every single time. And you know you you know you mentioned earlier Laura about trans people. I mean like you know what <laughs> what history teaches us is that trans people are always the thin end of an incredibly thick wedge. And we know yeah. that that is where they attack first, and they prey on people's mm-hmm. fears, and they prey on people's prejudices, and it's and the reason they go there yeah. first is out of a kind of cowardice. It, and of course, it's well. And who are the they who's, know? Yeah, and who's the, the other target? Trans people are a small That's demographic. Right incredibly small demographic massively misunderstood most people have no idea right. about the complexities even, even within, of identifying even frankly trans, often you know? within their own quote unquote community yeah. frankly even within the wider totally, LGBT yeah. community there is a lot of misunderstanding and, oh there's so yeah. much and also just out downright sheer bloody prejudice yeah. I know so many anti-trans sort of gay people I know right, so right, many it's unbelievable the, the interesting thing is that the, the scientific you know again this is this is not a, a, a something to go into right? but there's, there's a scientific misunderstanding because i've worked in um dna laboratories and i've mm-hmm. I, I have experience of this when we tried to um to implement gender testing of of fetuses in the womb and it can't mm-hmm. it's it's a very faulty science yeah. because you're relying yeah. on chromosomes and you're relying on hormones and scientifically speaking the, the the proportion of people who do not fit neatly into binary hormone and binary chromosome uh, mm-hmm. categories is actually far larger than you it's think. It's a non-trivial yeah. you know, so, percentage. percentage. A very non-trivial yeah, it is, it is, it is a non-trivial yeah. percentage. You know, and even yeah. these are people that you know uh, that may grow up and spend their entire lives quite happily identifying with their assigned gender. So sure. the science behind it is misunderstood, and we you know we come into understand this not yet, and it comes back to what you were saying about the science of race. The, the, mm-hmm. You know, when we start using disingenuously, we start using science. You know, science is a wonderful thing. It's also an incredibly powerful tool. And anybody yeah. can justify anything by saying there is science. But 
most people don't understand science. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's that you know genuinely that's, that's the truth. Most people don't yeah. understand science, and we've seen this with climate change. Now we've basically reached a consensus that the vast, vast, vast majority of scientists in the world agree that so, that climate change is a thing and that mm-hmm. we need to reverse it. And yet there are still people who cling on to very outdated, very, uh, uh, very poorly carried out. Uh, experiments saying that climate change is not a thing and again Mm -hmm. look at the anti-vax movement clinging to like shreds of a a widely debunked piece of scientific literature so science Mm -hmm. is a great thing it's also a thing that we need to wield with great caution i mean the the, the, the parallels between the anti-vaxxer thing and like a book like the bell curve are just they're they're so striking they're so striking it's the same thing and it always comes back to one one root text which has some you know badly bad methodology and incomplete data and they've just extrapolated Mm -hmm. a ton of crap and it's amazing how often you find yourself back at those core texts just going like really really this shit again um, and it's, I mean, it's something innately human too. I mean, behind something like the anti-vaxxer movement is, again, it's this need for identity. There is, it's almost like they're identifying in this counterculture way. You know, we, you know, it's almost like the supermarket of identity, you know what, isn't thing, it? You know, well, I'm this. Well, no, the, I, I think actually the anti-vaxxer thing is really interesting because it does play on a, on a genuine fear and a genuine concern mm-hmm. about, you know, about big pharma and about the way big pharmaceutical mm-hmm. companies operate. And I have absolutely no doubt that in other contexts they are behaving in incredibly immoral ways and they're totally, you know they're giving yeah, people totally. medicine that treats symptoms instead of treating causes and that they you know there's mm-hmm. more i mean god the amount of money that's been spent on on developing a drug like viagra no equivalent mm-hmm. for female sex drive or for that matter you know yeah curing cancer i mean like where are our priorities as a species you know there's a there's a wonderful uh they say wonderful it's not wonderful it's fucking infuriating (laughs) recently about um the fact that viagra was uh is incredibly effective at treating menstrual cramps Mm -hmm. but it was considered uh, a a trivial use for the drug so apparently erectile dysfunction is far more important than something that cripples women regularly every Mm -hmm. fucking month Um, the, the, interesting that you should you know obviously the uh, the big farmer thing is, is is true but what's really interesting is when you look at history the people who are fucked over by big farmer and but more broadly by medical experimentation are minorities yeah it's not yes. people like you and me right. it's not people right. like who are who are these comfortably middle class people who would rather um you know use these homeopathic remedies on their children than vex them mm. against fucking measles which might kill them yeah. um yeah. it's 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 minorities it's poor people it's black mm-hmm. people yeah. it's it's disabled people it's, it's people. autistic people yeah, yeah. it's yeah, oh it's bloody hell is it autistic people, people. Yeah. Absolutely. So all these people, and it is, you know, when you look at anti-vax, it does tend to be people in a position of privilege. So people yeah, who really are yeah, at no absolutely. danger of being fucked over by the government because the government is in the government's interest to keep these people fucking happy. It's mm-hmm. people on the bottom rung that, you know, you look at the history of, um, uh, in, in America, I believe it was syphilis was um, deliberately spread among black men. Yep. Yeah. yep. You know, it, the thing, and that's just one example, and there are a great many other examples of how minorities are screwed over in these in these scenarios. Mm-hmm. So yes, it's a legitimate fear, but it probably isn't going to affect it's any totally of us. Is. No, I mean it's given it's given rise to other sorts of myths, very much like that, isn't it? I mean there is a consistent myth in gay communities that AIDS and HIV was deliberately yeah, spread yeah, yeah. amongst a population. Theory, yeah. And, you know, I can understand why, because it sounds like something that could potentially happen. It's something I would give credence to if I represented evidence for it. I mean, we we talked about this, didn't we, when we covered Exquisite Corpse. Like, you couldn't have have scripted a much worse disease, could you? You couldn't really, if you wanted to, you couldn't have come up with a much worse scenario, you know, than that that particular. It was just... Oof. At that era, at that exactly, time, yeah. you know, in that political situation, yeah. it is. I mean, I can see why people would believe yeah. that it was a conspiracy. I can totally see it. But you know what? The truth's horrifying enough, which is just that it no is. one gave a fuck until straight is, no people started shit, dying. Yeah. You know, it's just. Ugh. Yeah. Good, well, that cheered yeah. me up. Just, <laughs> just a bunch of queers, isn't it? You know? Yeah. <laughs> just a bunch of queers, yeah. you know? And, you know, to c- coming back full circle again to when the wind blows, it's the opposite of, course. of that. You know, you've got the two ends of the spectrum. You've got people who are suspicious of everything the government tells them, and you've got yeah. people who yeah. believe slavishly mm-hmm. in everything the government tells them, and neither is a, is a healthy scenario. 
<laughs> no. Yeah, it's it's a very difficult tightrope to walk that, isn't it? Because it's very difficult to discern what the implications are. Where are you? Where do we sit in that regard? How much scepticism is healthy and how much is downright dangerous? Yeah. How, mu- how much do we do we rely on the powers that be, as Jim puts it, to keep us <laughs> yeah. safe and to keep us yeah. informed? And how much do we have to rely on ourselves it's how you just don't know it's an idea yeah. and i guess there's that there's the kind of inherent horror when the when the wind blows we talk about it being a a generational thing but are there people in our own generation that would react in exactly the same way totally well we've got it i mean you you pointed it out with the climate change thing yeah. and whatnot there are still vast swathes of people who don't believe that's happening or who on the alternate side just don't care um yeah. yeah, I mean, it's something you and I have talked about, George, isn't it? People who just say, well, it's, you know, I'll, I'll be dead before it affects, you know. Oh, I'm so it's just like, fucking sick of hearing yeah, that. Yeah, and it's just like, well. I'm getting okay. to the point where I'm losing a lot of respect for people and I'm losing a lot of friends over yeah. there. Even, yeah. as, even as somebody, you know, I don't have children, I never will have children, so there's no next generation for me to be yeah. concerned about. It doesn't matter, I still don't want them all to die. Likewise, <laughs> likewise. I mean, I was, I was pondering this exact thing whilst considering when the wind blows actually the fact that the vast majority of the people who have said that to me oh well i'll be dead by the time it happens or it doesn't you know it won't happen in my lifetime whatever it's referring to by the way whatever catastrophe it's potentially referring to they all have children yeah every single one of them and the vast majority of them have grandchildren yeah no, this it's is just it. This attitude yeah. of if I'm not there to see it, does it? You know, if a tree falls mm-hmm. to the woods and there's no one there to hear, hear mm-hmm. to see it. Does it make a sound? It's don't don't you feel there's something just so kind of inherently kind of sociopathic about that though? I just find it so yeah. weird. You know, like yeah. yeah like, Do you not want the world to be a, a better? I mean, not even not even the same level of good surely you want it to be better for the yeah. next surely generation. Even yes i want that and i've got no genetic stakes right. in this Ex- i yeah. still want the next generation to have a better life than i did yeah. it's exactly that that's the thing that baffles me so much laura i mean i i mean the exactly the same boat as you i don't have children i i don't want children it's just it's just not my, what i want and I do, therefore do not have a particular horse in this race, as it were, you know, when I die, it's the end. It's not going to happen. Anymore. I don't think my brother wants children either. So when we're done, we're done. Mm. That's the and, end, you know? And yet you still, it's still inconceivable to you to leave the world a worse place. Well, it, it appalls me. I mean, the, the, the attitude appalls me to the point whereby I have cut off people who have said that to me. I'm like, you know what? I don't have to, I, all of my respect has gone. Yeah. I can't look at you anymore and I can't listen to you and think you're a worthwhile person, <laughs> you know? I just can't. It's not there anymore. Sorry. Yeah, and I think it's, you know, it, it does feel to me that the the challenge the challenge that we're facing right now, especially when it comes to climate change, it just we really we're way 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 past the point where we've got we we don't have time for the debate even if we had the inclination nope. we don't have the time we just don't no you know um the science is settled the clock is ticking you know like yep. it's it, what we do in the next decade is going to make it's, it's going to decide it everything it is actually going to decide everything for this it's actually going know. to decide the fate of humanity potentially the fate of all life on the yeah. planet so if you want your fight if you want your big epic meta narrative yeah if you've ever wondered what you'd do at the end of the world congratulations you're doing it i mean this is it yeah. right this is it this is where we're, we're here right now um and that's you know i mean that that's where i think i mean that's where i think this art you know this this film this book even though it's about an old apocalypse even though it's about you know the the apocalypse of the of the end of the 20th century rather than the one we're facing mm-hmm. now where it does have relevance where it does have resonance it's exactly that point where it's about mm-hmm. saying you just watch that how does that make you feel if you don't want this you have to do something to stop it from happening you know, yeah. because you talked to both of you have spoken about the feeling of that impulse of just wanting to reach in and pick them up and take them out and give them a hug and, and mm-hmm. fix them up. And it's like, no, you can't. By the time you get there, it's too late. So yeah. here and now make make good choices, you know, <laughs> like make yeah. some good choices. Absolutely. Uh, and yeah. I think I mean, like, it's an expression of the same concerns. Yeah, absolutely. Isn't it? It's the same concerns. Um, and I think that that's, you know, I don't think. Uh, I, I mean, I don't actually. I don't think that's a message that ever goes out of fashion. But I don't think it's ever been more vital 
than it is mm-hmm. right now in, in 2019. You know, I think that's a, that's a message yeah. that should be shared from every rooftop. So, uh, yeah, you know, I think, uh, it, yeah, it's really, it, yeah, it's really important. Stuff that work like this matters. You know, it really does. Totally. Yeah. I, I couldn't agree more. Could not agree more. And I think, uh, guys, I think that is probably the perfect note to end this conversation on. What say you? Sounds good to me. Yeah, I'm happy if you're happy. Fantastic. Thank. Well, thank you so, so much, guys. That was a fantastic conversation. It really was. Um, Laura, thank you so much for coming on. It's been an absolute pleasure having you here. Yeah. Well, thank you for having me. It was a really, really interesting conversation. It was my, my sincere pleasure. I hope you come on again. I'd love to have oh, you on if again. If you, you have, have me. Totally. <laughs> if there's anything else that you'd like to discuss, please hit us up and let us know. Um, is there anything that you'd like to, uh, as, we, as we always say at the end of this, is there anything you'd like to pimp out, Laura? Laura. Oh, shameless plug time. My favorite yeah, time. Yeah, shameless plugs. Totally shameless. Go for it. No, I do, so I do have, I actually have a conversationally relevant thing because in my, I've got a, sh- a short story collection coming out uh, at the end of this month or mm-hmm. Amazon if you are an evil um, um, in August if you are an evil empire Amazon buyer <laughs> um, and it contains my short story Looking for Lyca which is very heavily influenced by When the Wind Blows and ah. media surrounding that so yes Fantastic I will put links below ladies and gentlemen by the way uh, Kit is there anything you'd like to pimp out? So yeah uh, the the finite which uh, again very heavily influenced by When the Wind Blows is, uh, <laughs> is coming out uh, early July I'll actually uh, I think uh, I think we're launching it at Edgelit. I'm pretty sure that's confirmed now. Um, so yeah, um, I'll, the, there should be copies there, um, and it will be available. I think it's already available to pre-order actually now from Black Shock Books. So uh, head on over there and have a look if you if you fancy uh, my attempt to completely destroy and break your heart. <laughs> Having had a sneak peek at it, I it will ruin you. <laughs> oh, brilliant. I'm looking forward to that. Um, that sounds really. Although I may have to, you know, after experiencing when the wind blows, I may have to put some distance. I, th- some I think time you. I think you will need to have a stiff whiskey when you read this book. Brilliant. <laughs> Any excuse. <laughs> any excuse uh as for myself ladies and gents you can find me knocking about here on the exaggerated elegy channel and there's lots of fiction and stuff available over at strangeplaygrounds.com and if you'd like my fiction that you can find short story collections on the the evil empire of amazon uh so uh, until next time ladies and gentlemen bye-bye bye 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 <laughs> Ha 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 